hyper playtime. Okay, I'll show you again. First, you put this, here. That's not how. Maggie said hesitantly. Oh shush now. I know what I'm doing. Like I said. You put this here, and then you. Maggie groaned with frustration. But Charlotte, why do I have to do this? Can't you just do it? Charlotte sighed. Maggie, you can't just expect someone else to do this for you. But it's hard, Maggie complained. Come on, you can do it, Charlotte said encouragingly. Yeah, but when am I ever going to need to know how to do differential calculus? Maggie put down her pencil and rested her head in her hands. Don't ask me. You just asked me to help you with this. Charlotte motioned to Maggie's homework spread out over the kitchen table. It's not my fault that those population growth graphs can be analyzed more easily than they showed you in class. Maggie took off the VR goggles. They weren't so many goggles as lightweight glasses with earbuds. Despite looking like a cheap toy, they probably cost more than Maggie's laptop. She carefully placed them on the table before getting up and going to the fridge. She returned with her water bottle. Condensation already forming on the frigid metal. Rolling it back and forth across her forehead before unscrewing the cap and taking a sip. Then she sat back down. Put the glasses back on, and tried to make sense of the bars and graphs on the paper before her. Whenever Maggie looked up. Charlotte was quite literally climbing the walls. She had recently realized that an unlimited virtual wardrobe, and no reliance on the laws of physics, opened up untold possibilities for outrageous cosplay. Right now she was crouching on top of the open door, wearing a red and blue catsuit with a web pattern. Her generously padded posterior made her Spider-Man impression less convincing. The web pattern on the catsuit slowly changed as Charlotte found more reference images online. Finally, Maggie closed her books. She leaned back and sighed heavily. Charlotte jumped down from the door and sat on the corner of the table. She cocked her head to the side and looked at Maggie. So, still dry? Um, yeah, Maggie said. Charlotte's matter-of-fact attitude about incontinence was still a little jarring to her. That rewrite of yours put things right. I can't wait to get rid of these pads. Maggie reached down and adjusted herself in a very unladylike manner. Good. Wanna see something cool? Charlotte asked with a sly grin. Maggie realized she wouldn't get anything else done before Charlotte got this out of her system. What? she asked warily. Charlotte stood. Her catsuit slowly morphing into a reasonably accurate copy of the classic Wonder Woman outfit. Complete with star-spangled plastic panties covering her diapers. Okay, Maggie said and smiled. That is pretty cute. Oh, that's not what I wanted to show you. This is just because I thought it'd be more appropriate. Charlotte threw her golden lasso around Maggie. Tying her to the chair. Maggie tried to get out of the virtual rope. But found she was securely tied and couldn't move her arms. Charlotte quickly looped the rope a couple of times around the chair to immobilize Maggie's legs too. What? How? Maggie started. Charlotte sat on the edge of the table in front of Maggie. I can paralyze parts of your body to simulate you being tied up. Among other things. Oh my. This is a whole new side of you Charlotte, Maggie said. Naughty, naughty Charlotte. Shush. Charlotte placed a finger against Maggie's lips and Maggie felt her tongue and lips go numb. Maggie looked sternly. Or rather tried to look sternly at Charlotte. She found it was hard to seem bossy when she was helpless. Charlotte leaned closer and touched her index finger to Maggie's nose. B-O-O-P, she said. Feeling returned to Maggie's face and the golden rope melted away. Freeing her arms and legs. Maggie massaged her wrists. They weren't sore. But it seemed the thing to do after having been tied up. Even if the rope hadn't been real. I didn't think bondage was your thing, Maggie commented. It's not, but judging from the contents of your phone, and your friend Anita's. 
I thought you might like it. You snooped through my phone. Only once. And only to get internet access. That's how I did it back when the internet here was shut off. Charlotte said defensively. I used the phones of the cleaning and maintenance people that came by every now and then. That. That's private. Maggie yelled, outraged. Charlotte shrank back. I'm sorry, she said. Looking like she was about to cry. But I wanted to find out more about you. I had been waiting to find you again for 48 years. The guilt at having yelled at Charlotte. However, justified, was like a kick in Maggie's gut. She sighed and ran her hand through her hair. Look, she said, phones are like diaries. No more snooping. Not my phone or anyone else's. K. Charlotte pouted a little. But it was obvious she knew she had crossed a line. I'm sorry, she repeated. I won't do it again. I promise. She looked so despondent that Maggie couldn't help herself. She rose and put her arms around Charlotte, stroking her back. She knew that Charlotte was exaggerating the little girl's act. But for some reason, she just couldn't help seeing her as the regressed child she had been at Eliza's. After a little while, Maggie let go of Charlotte and sat down on one of the kitchen chairs. Are you mad? Charlotte asked, still only looking at the floor. Yeah, but mostly I'm disappointed. Maggie couldn't quite believe she had uttered that incredible cliché. I was bad, Charlotte continued. A bad, bad girl. She looked back up, a sly smile spreading across her face. I deserve a spanking. Charlotte, cut it out. Maggie threw up her arms in annoyance. I'm not into that kind of stuff. Okay, okay. Charlotte raised her hands defensively. Five gigs of files would say otherwise, she said under her breath. Huh? Nothing, Charlotte said airily. Anyway, are you done with your homework? More or less. Why? I figured you earned yourself a treat after working so hard. What did you have in mind? I'll show you in a minute, but first. Charlotte pouted and did her little girl routine. Can you change me? Sure. Okay, see you downstairs. Charlotte beamed and disappeared in a shower of sparks reminiscent of the Star Trek transporter effect. Maggie went down to the empty white room below her basement that she thought of as Charlotte's room. Charlotte was already sitting on the tiled platform. Dangling her legs off the edge. When she saw Maggie enter, she scooted back and lay down. There's something I've been meaning to ask you, Maggie said while she slid the blue and white Wonder Woman pants off Charlotte. She couldn't feel the material, but it still behaved as if it was actually there. A small voice in Maggie's head said that what she was doing would look really strange to anybody not wearing her VR glasses. What's that? Charlotte lifted her hips to let Maggie pull her diaper out from under her. The diaper disappeared in a small puff of sparks when Maggie dropped it. Well, why don't you rewrite yourself so you don't need the diapers anymore? I don't know. Charlotte shrugged. Maybe it's because they've been a part of my life for so long. You have to remember I needed them for more than 40 years. Makes sense, I guess. But couldn't you just have the diapers change themselves instead of having me do it? Maggie took the washcloth from the bowl next to Charlotte and carefully cleaned her. But I like it when you change me. Charlotte said with a little duck-faced pout. She giggled as Maggie sprinkled baby powder on her and pulled a fresh diaper up her legs. Taping it in place. It feels nice. Much better than when I do it myself. Charlotte slid closer to Maggie and wrapped her arms around her waist to give her a clumsy hug. But what about you? Charlotte asked, her voice muffled as her face was still pressed against Maggie's midriff. Why did you want to get rid of your diapers? I mean, you like to wear them, don't you? What? No. How? Charlotte let go of Maggie and slid away from her. She looked down, suddenly finding her own hands incredibly interesting. It was on your phone too, she said. 
Charlotte sounded like she was admitting to burning down orphanages for the insurance money. Maggie sighed heavily and sat down on the edge of the platform. I guess, she finally admitted. What do you mean? Charlotte scooted to the edge of the platform. Yeah, I like wearing them. Maggie's voice was barely louder than a whisper. She studied her shoes intently. I just don't want to have to use them. Not at all. Charlotte cocked her head. Don't you hate it? Maggie said, not answering Charlotte's question. At first, yeah. But I got used to it. After a while, the diapers was just the way things were. I just stopped thinking about it. Well, I don't want to get used to it. If I'm going to pee, it's going to be my decision, not some software glitch. Maggie crossed her arms defiantly. Charlotte slid off the platform and stood in front of Maggie. She put a hand on Maggie's forearm. But if you could. Would you want to have, like, a red, no, yellow button for it? I mean, that way. It'd be your choice to lose control. I, Maggie hesitated. It wouldn't be too hard to set up now that I know what to rewrite, Charlotte said confidently. You could probably have the whole thing as an app on your phone. Maggie thought about it. It could be fun. And it would still be her choice. Of course, it would only work as long as you're close to the house. Once you go far enough away from the normal sucker. You'd revert to normal. That settled it for Maggie. The fact that it'd be something that could only happen at home made it feel safer somehow. Okay, she said. Let's do it. Hop up and let's get to work. Charlotte patted the platform and the mattress draped in a colourful plastic sheet appeared. Maggie reached out to touch it. She knew it wasn't actually there. But it looked so real. When her fingers touched it she couldn't feel anything. But the sound gave it away. Plastic sheets. Maggie looked at Charlotte. Really? I'm just taking precautions. Charlotte said with a grin. But they're not real anyway. Oh don't be such a spoil sport. Think of it as being an immersion thing. After all, they're real to me. Maggie slid onto the platform, swung her legs up, and lay back. This is so weird, she said. What is? This whole seeing things that aren't really here thing. I keep catching myself walking around things I know aren't really there. It's like you avoid stepping on the lines if somebody's drawn hopscotch on the pavement. Even if you're just walking. Charlotte smiled. Imagine how I felt at first when I could sit on things that weren't really there. It took me months to get used to the fact that I make the rules for my surroundings. So I think you're handling it pretty well. Maggie only smiled and shrugged in reply. So, are you ready to play doctor? Charlotte asked as her Wonder Woman outfit shimmered and paled to turn into a nurse's uniform straight out of a catalogue of Halloween costumes. Maggie sighed and rolled her eyes. Really? she asked. You went for the provocative nurse? Oh shush. Who said I can't have fun while I work? Charlotte snapped her fingers. A remote control with a big, red button appeared in her hand. What does that do? Maggie eyed the button suspiciously. I can use this to knock you out or real sedatives. And to be honest, I think this is safer. Yeah, I guess. After all, it's not like I'm going to get addicted to this. Maggie pressed the button. Her finger sinking slightly into it before the sensors caught up with her movement. The remote promptly vanished. Oh, I'm not so sure about that, Charlotte said with a sly smile. She leaned closer, intentionally giving Maggie a good look at her cleavage that suddenly seemed more impressive than before. May I? she whispered. Charlotte, you know I don't think of you like that, right? Yeah, yeah. I know. But may I? Okay. But the clothes stay on. Dill? Relax, Charlotte said softly. I promised you a treat, didn't I? She leaned down and kissed Maggie's forehead. Waves of warmth flowed from the kiss, filling Maggie's mind in seconds. 
Maggie felt like she was drowning in an ocean of pleasure. Then, as quickly as it started, it was over and Maggie was left gasping for breath. What, she finally managed. Charlotte grinned. In layman's terms. I gave your brain's pleasure center a little poke. Can't, can't feel my feet, Maggie wheezed. Don't worry about it. Charlotte sat down next to Maggie and slowly stroked her hair. Night night. Then everything faded to black. When Maggie slowly drifted back to consciousness, she awoke to find Charlotte sitting in a bean bag next to the platform. She was still wearing the skimpy nurse outfit. But the skirt had slid up so much that her diapers were clearly visible. When she saw that Maggie was awake, she rose in a way that suggested that gravity didn't quite apply to her and moved over to the platform. She placed a hand on Maggie's forehead. What are you doing? Maggie mumbled. Oh just checking to see if you have a fever. Kissing your boo-boos to make them better. You know, nurse stuff. I'm fine. Maggie brushed Charlotte's hand aside and rolled over on her side to sit up. So, did it work? she asked. Charlotte shrugged. I don't know. Are you wet? Um, no. Maggie shook her head. She picked up her phone and saw a new app on the screen. It didn't have a name and the icon showed a picture of a cartoon-style, yellow remote control. She was about to press it when Charlotte cleared her throat. Aren't you forgetting something, she asked. Um, I don't know. Am I? Maggie looked at Charlotte. Charlotte raised an eyebrow. If you turn that on, don't you want to take a couple of precautions? She patted her own voluminous diaper. Oh, Maggie said. Good point. These pads aren't built for this. A few minutes later and two floors up, Maggie rolled off her bed. She pulled her jeans up over the full-size diaper and, after struggling a little, managed to button them. Not quite designed to handle that kind of extra padding, are they? Maggie said from the doorway where she was peeking in. You might have to invest in a couple of roomier ones if you plan on wearing diapers more often. Or maybe think to consider switching to skirts. Yeah, I guess, Maggie admitted. But let's see how this works first. She pulled out her phone and started the new app. The screen just showed a red button saying off. Maggie caught herself holding her breath as her thumb hovered over the button. Then, with a slow, deliberate exhale she pressed it. The button on the screen changed from red to green. But other than that, nothing happened. Are you sure this thing's working? Maggie looked up at Charlotte. Charlotte seemed lost in thought for a moment. It's working, she said. Just give it a little time. Did you have to go before? Maggie shook her head. No, not really. Well that explains it then. Huh? Turning off your bladder control isn't going to magically fill it. It only works like that in cheesy stories. Which you've read, Maggie concluded. I had to do research, Charlotte said, grinning like the Cheshire cat. For science. I'm sure. Maggie pushed the bag containing her diaper supplies back under the bed and headed to the bathroom to wash her hands. The next hour or so went by pretty much like normal. Maggie did some laundry and cleared the books and her homework off the kitchen table. She was in the middle of making dinner when her phone rang. Yeah? Hang on while I put you on speaker. Maggie fiddled with the phone and put it on the shelf above the stove. Okay. Hey, Maggie, Anita said from between the pepper and the oregano. Are you okay? Chris said you haven't been to class for a couple of days. Um, yeah. I've been sick. Oh. Do you need anything? Like groceries? Or beer? Nah, I'm feeling a lot better now. I just didn't want to move too far from my bathroom, Maggie said, deftly avoiding the whole truth. Ah. Say no more. Anyway, I just wanted to check if we're still on for the big game on Saturday. Anita? It's a poker game between you and me and the boys. 
It's hardly the big game. Maybe not for you, but I have to take Max down a peg or two. He's been getting a little uppity lately. Really? And your usual way of dealing with it isn't working. Anita only chuckled in reply. Just then, Maggie felt a warm rush in her diaper. Oh God, she said with a surprised gasp. What? I have to go, Maggie said quickly, reaching for the phone. Ah, Anita said, coming to her own conclusions. By then. Maggie hung up and leaned on the kitchen counter. Trying to stop the pee that was flowing into her diaper. It soon slowed to a trickle. But Maggie wasn't sure if it was because of her efforts or not. Whatever the reason was, it didn't change the fact that Maggie felt the warmth spreading back across the lower part of her butt. It was both strange and familiar at the same time. The lack of warning, and control, actually felt kind of exhilarating. Maggie smiled feeling the damp, velvety padding brushing against her skin. Just admit it. You love it. Maggie turned around to see Charlotte sitting on the edge of the table. Dangling her legs. Excitement quickly turned to embarrassment as Maggie realized what she must look like. She snatched her hand away and turned back to stirring the pot on the stove. It's okay, you know. Charlotte poofed from the table to the kitchen counter next to the stove. Maggie remained silent. Focusing her attention on the contents of the pot in front of her. What? Charlotte asked. Would you have preferred if I went all bossy or mothery and threaten you with a sound spanking because that's no way for a proper lady to behave? She said those last words with an exaggerated British accent. No. It's just that I, Maggie paused and then sighed. You can tell me. After all, Charlotte patted her big diaper, it's not like I'm in any position to be judgmental. I know. Maggie sighed again. It just. Feels good. Maggie helped. Yeah, but. Well, isn't that what you wanted? Kind of. What do you mean? Maggie turned back towards Charlotte and leaned against the wall. A sheepish look on her face. You're gonna think it's stupid and weird. The noncorporeal, diaper-wearing scientist who's been dead for seven years is going to lecture you about anything being weird. Really? Maggie closed her eyes and took a deep breath. It's not the peeing. I could do that any time I wanted. Then what? It's the whole, not helplessness. Maggie made some indeterminate gestures while she struggled to find the right word. Feebleness. Charlotte asked helpfully. Disability? She grinned at wiggling her eyebrows. Impotence? Maggie rolled her eyes at Charlotte who smiled back with mock innocence. So you're saying is that what you like is not being in control? What's so bad about that? It's. It's kind of what happened in Eliza's place. Maggie looked down. And I didn't want to make you think I wanted to go back there. Charlotte put a hand on Maggie's arm. I know you don't. Maggie looked back up at Charlotte. It's not like I like not having control in general. I don't want to be tied up or anything. It's just with the diapers. Millimeter him. Charlotte didn't say anything else. Feeling that this was something Maggie needed to get off her chest. And I don't want to go full baby either, with pacifiers and honesties and stuff. I know it doesn't make sense. It's just that it helps me relax. I don't have to worry about anything. So would you want to be cared for and changed by someone as well? Not like Eliza, but somebody else. I don't know. Maybe, Maggie said hesitantly. But sometimes I want to do that to somebody else. Like you do for me. Charlotte asked quietly. MMMM yeah. Christopher? Maggie gave a short laugh. Yeah, like he'd go for that. Maggie poured the contents of the pot into a bowl and filled the dirty pot with water, leaving it in the sink for later. She brought the bowl to the table and sat down, smiling a little. Did you just? Charlotte was lying on her stomach on the table. Yeah, Maggie admitted sheepishly. 
Just a little dribble though. Not like before. That's what you'll usually have. So you might as well get used to it. Charlotte scooted closer. So, do you still like it? Maggie blushed. I'll take that as a yes, Charlotte said with a grin. You know what? I'm going to go watch a movie or something, give you some quality alone time. She vanished in a sparkly cloud. Leaving Maggie alone with her thoughts. Diaper service needed. Joy divorced her husband long ago due to not being in love anymore. Joe had simply lost interest in staying with his wife. This led to Joy getting custody of the kids and ownership of the family home. She still gets support for Tim until he turns 21. Three adults live in the home but no one has a full-time job. Joy sells Avon part-time going door-to-door -door in her neighborhood. Tim mows laws in the neighborhood. Many of his customers are mother's Avon customers. Sue manages to make money in the neighborhood doing babysitting jobs for special needs kids. Sue has no problem watching older kids with special needs, a couple of them are 18 and 20 years old. Sue noticed the special needs kids have a diaper service. She thought diaper services had been discontinued years ago. Disposable diapers are quite common these days. The story takes place in Austin, Texas in the year 2015. Today is Friday the 10th day of May. The hot weather has arrived with occasional afternoon thunder showers. The base home is single-story with three bedrooms and two bathrooms. They live in a large subdivision outside of Austin. Joy discovered again today that Tim wet his bed the previous night. He said nothing about this and made the bed wet. Tim figured he can wash the sheets when home alone sometime. Chapter 1, Being Friday The family looks forward to the weekend. Today Tim mowed two lawns making a total of $40 in cash. He is back home around 4 p.m. and takes a hot shower. His mother Joy found the wet bed for the third time this week. So far she has not confronted Tim about his bedwetting. Tim's mattress has a plastic cover for protection. This still leaves the sheets, blanket, and Tim's pyjamas pea-soaked when he wets the bed. Mom is tired of the extra work washing and drying pea-soaked things several days a week. The family has a washer and dryer but Joy has had enough of washing pea-soaked clothes, sheets, and blankets. Sue arrived back home at 4 o'clock too with Tim in the shower. Sue was babysitting an older special needs girl named Cindy. Her parents use a diaper service because Cindy need diapers all of the time. Sue has become an expert at changing diapers. Sue joins mother at the dining room table while dinner is cooking in the crock pot. Joy is making beef stew with carrots, potatoes, and sirloin of beef chunks. Mother is going to talk to Sue about her brother's bedwetting. I hate to say it but Tim wet the bed again last night, Joy told Sue, that makes three times this week already. Even worse he just makes the bed thinking no one will notice he wet it. That is pretty lame if you ask me, Sue said understanding how mom feels, his room is starting to smell like pee too. What do you think we should do since we both end up doing his pee-soaked laundry? Mom asked her daughter. I babysat Cindy for the last three days and she wears diapers as a young adult, Sue stated, she has major wetting problems. Diapers? That is what I feel Tim needs, mother spoke up. Cindy is 18 years old with special needs, Sue said, she has been wearing diapers all of her life and has a diaper service. I thought a diaper service was a thing of the past, Joy said. So did I mom until I started babysitting special needs kids, Sue replied, Cindy's mom uses Happy Nappy for cloth diapers. Sue was there one day when Happy Nappy came by to drop off another bundle of diapers. 
A nice middle-aged lady Stacy gave Sue her card with their phone number and address. Sue hands the card to mother who smiles when she sees this. I need to call Happy Nappy right now about Tim's problem, Joy decided grabbing the phone. Meanwhile Tim is finishing up showering and washing his hair. He shaved his face first to look good after his shower. Tim has long brown hair for a male that goes past his shirt collar. He don't know mother found his wet bed again and washed the sheets. Hello this is Joy Base living at Texas Acres Subdivision, she said, my older son is wetting the bed for some reason. How old is the boy, asked the middle-aged woman who gave her card to Sue. We service that area a lot. My son is 19 and has been wetting the bed again for a year, Joy said, I am tired of washing wet sheets and clothing. There is no need for that ma'am, Stacy said, sounds like you need overnight diapers for Tim. Does he wet during the day? It appears to be just an overnight problem although his briefs are occasionally pee-stained, Joy told Stacy. We have cloth diapers for all ages and Tim will need a fitting, Stacy said, how about Saturday at 10 o'clock in the morning? I will bring over a few different size nappies ready to wear. That is perfect especially if he wets overnight again, Joy said, he is 19 and will take some convincing to put back in diapers. How big is your son as far as height and weight? Stacy asked. He is small for his age being just 5 feet 4 inches tall at 120 pounds, Joy told Stacy. do you have plastic baby panties too? Of course ma'am, that is part of our service, Stacy said. I will bring what is needed with me tomorrow. After a little more talking the two hang up the phone. Stacy said the cloth nappies have pinked edges just like a toddler diaper. She said that a bundle is 20 diapers and 5 pairs of plastic pants. Stacy explained how it is best to layer 3 or 4 diapers together. Joy said to bring 2 bundles and see how that works for now. Good for you mother, Sue said smiling we are both tired of cleaning up after Tim's wetting. Happy Nappy delivers clean diapers up to twice a week. They pick up the soiled diapers when they bring more. This is going to be great, Joy replied, no more wet beds. Suddenly Tim is heard back in his bedroom. He gets dressed after combing his wet hair. Tim arrives at the dining room table wearing dark blue shorts with a white t-shirt on. He has on white tube socks but no shoes. What is this some kind of family meeting? Tim asked seeing mom and Sue at the table. I was not invited to attend. Yes honey it was a family meeting but it was not planned, Joy assured Tim, I found out you made your bed wet again today. Sorry, I was going to wash the sheets later in private, Tim said feeling embarrassed about his bed wetting. I have a solution to your bed wetting problem, Joy told Tim. Chapter 2 Moving ahead to Saturday morning Joy walks in her son Tim's bedroom at 9am. He is still asleep when mother sees he wet the bed again. She pulls his blanket and sheets down. Get up Tim you wet the bed again last night, Joy lectured, now I have to wash your peed sheets and clothing again. Sorry mom but I never knew this was happening, Tim admitted, I was dreaming when I woke up wetting the bed. I told you yesterday that I have a solution for your problem. Joy stated, take a shower and I will fill you in on that. Embarrassed by wetting again Tim takes a morning shower and puts on clean briefs with brown shorts and a yellow t-shirt. He washes his hair again and shaves again. Tim is wondering what in the world mother has in mind to help with his bedwetting. Tim never even thinks of diapers at his age as a solution. Please take care of the wet mess in your brother's room, Joy told Sue, one more time will be the last honey. Okay mom, I am glad this will be the last time, Sue answered. At the breakfast table around 9.30am Joy fills Tim in on her plans. Sue is also present to see her brother's reaction. Mom started by telling Tim it is immature to be wetting the bed. Then Tim gets the shock of his adult life. I hired a diaper service for your bed wetting sweetie, Mom said, I am tired of cleaning up things after your wet beds. Diaper service. You must be kidding me mother, Tim said. Mom is not kidding Tim, Sue spoke up, I babysit young adults with special needs and they have a diaper service. I gave mom their card, they are called happy nappy. I am not happy. Tim exclaimed, 
I don't need diapers either. Sorry but my decision is final, mother said firmly, Stacy is coming over at 10am this morning for a fitting. What do you mean fitting? Tim asked, this is ridiculous. You are going to be fitted in properly sized cloth diapers, mother informed Tim, then two bundles of nappies will be left in your correct size with plastic baby panties. Tim is not happy about this but has always obeyed mother. He objects again but Joy is not changing her plans. Joy points out that Tim lives at home and will do as he is told. She even said Tim was not too old to be spanked if needed. I suggest you cooperate with Stacy to avoid being spanked in front of the middle-aged lady, Joy said as the last word. Breakfast of hot oatmeal with fruit is finished and the dishes are done by the time the doorbell rings. It is Stacy with her pink happy nappy diaper delivery van. She is invited inside where Sue joins them after putting the clothes in the dryer. You must be Tim the older boy who started wetting the bed again, Stacy said to Tim, I have a solution to your problem. Yes ma'am, mother just told me what's going on this morning, Tim replied with a red face, I don't want any nappies ma'am. Apparently you want a spanking over my knees, Joy scolded Tim, you have no choice about this baby. Stacy will fit you in the correct size diaper this morning. Okay mom but I don't like this at all, Tim objected once again. Stacy laid a diaper mat on the carpet in the living room. She has what she thinks will be the perfect size diaper for Tim. If not she has a few other sizes in the truck ready to wear. You will need to get undressed first Tim, Stacy instructed. Tim's mind is blown by what is taking place. He is hesitant to get naked in front of mom, sister, and a strange lady. He is about to be fitted in cloth diapers at the age of 19. Eventually Tim undresses although he is quite embarrassed. I have seen many nude males and females, Stacy said, to me you are just overgrown toddlers. Your sister and I have seen you naked before and changed your diapers back when you were five years old, mother pointed out. With only his white briefs on Tim laid on the diaper mat hoping he can be fitted this way. Stacy kneels down and lays out some diaper rash cream and baby powder. She sets a small stack of the pinked edge cloth diapers next to Tim. Stacy puts three of what she calls nappies together in a pile. The nappies are 20 inches by 32 inches after washing and drying. They are thick and absorbent especially with three layered together. The pinked edge white diapers are just like a baby or toddler wears only bigger. A pair of milky white plastic panties are laid out in an adult size small. Stacy is ready to diaper Tim but the briefs are coming off first. Sorry but you don't wear briefs under a diaper, Stacy said quickly removing Tim's briefs. Tim instinctively covers his private parts with his hands. Stacy slaps his hands and makes Tim get them out of the way. She starts by grabbing both of Tim's ankles and lifting his bottom. The diaper stack is put in place and Tim lowered back down. Stacy lifts again to apply diaper rash cream and baby powder. No need to be so embarrassed, Stacy said, anyone who wets the bed needs diapers. I hear you have day accidents too. No ma'am, I don't wet my pants, Tim said, just the bed. Mom's spoon. Considering it hurts so much at the time, you may think it odd that I remember my mom's spanking spoon with such affection. However, it taught me and my siblings a great deal about morals and love. Mom had many spoons in her kitchen which were used for mixing and stirring. However one with a particularly wide head stood on the counter on its own, standing up in a little ceramic pot. This was the spanking spoon and on it, mom had written a Bible reference. It was Proverbs 23 verse 13. Do not withhold discipline from a child, if you punish them with the rod, they will not die. 
Well, I can assure you there were times when I was over her knee that I felt I might die all right. Mom's spanking spoon could burn a hole in your butt with absolutely no trouble, even through pants. We were very rarely spanked without our undergarments on, you had to be really naughty for mom to decide you'd earned that, but the sting that spoon could produce was more than capable of chastisement, believe me, even though a couple of layers of clothing. In that respect, I think my sisters always felt they had a disadvantage to us boys when they were spanked. I guess she felt that it wasn't too easy to spank the girls through a skirt or dress, so when they were put over her knee, she turned up their nether clothing and whacked them over their panties. These offered much less protection. When we got it, we really feared the spoon. It stung like you'd sat down on a wasp's nest. I guess because you were going to get a spanking once your clothing had been adjusted. This was the 1950s and my mom commonly wore a soft cotton floral apron around the house most of the day, and I distinctly remember, the feeling of the warm fabric brushing against my tummy as I was spanked. Mom was a highly efficient spanker and she showed no mercy when it came your time to be chastised. Boy or girl, you were left with a very sore button in floods of tears. However, there would be so much love shown after the spanking that in some ways you didn't mind so much that you had been punished. Mom would sit you on her lap and cuddle you close, stroking your hair and gently talking to calm you down. for baby to come in. My name is Amanda. These last two years have been the most wonderful years ever. I have graduated college with a PhD in music and have skyrocketed to number one on the charts as a rock and roll star named Baby Kitten. I am a small girl, only four foot nine inches tall and am very petite. I wear ponytails and dress as a little girl when I perform. My fans rave about how cute and adorable I am. I get many proposals for marriage. My single hits are all at number one at the same time. A most unprecedented and unusual occurrence. Baby Kisses is the most popular song of all time. I have gotten 24 gold and 16 platinum records and am still climbing fast. I walk out on stage, the crowd goes wild. There are cheers and catcalls everywhere. I can see many flashbulbs all over the stadium. I give what I feel is my very best performance to date. I play baby doll first. The crowd has gone utterly wild. It looks almost like a riot. I finish with baby kisses to a standing ovation. My agent is more than overjoyed as he talks a 1,000 miles an hour about a world tour. He tells me of the millions I just made and how many record albums we are about to sell. He begins to lay out the road tour coming in a week. I am really excited and look forward to the tour. Suddenly, for no reason, my mom pops into my head. The more time passes, the more urgent the thoughts of mom become. I think of home and seriously miss being there. It's like I am being called to come home. I decide to pay a visit home before the upcoming road tour. My agent isn't really for it, but he has no choice, I insist. I make arrangements to meet him at the recording studio in five days and give him a contact number for me in case plans change. I drive a soft baby blue Lotus Europa. I pull up at mom's house. Of course everyone notices I have come back. It is still home to me and I feel the pangs in my heart. I am really missing being here by now and am eager to see mom. Many of my old neighbors see me as I pull in and have stopped what they are doing to wave. I wave back. Mom comes out on the porch and smiles at me. It's like a ray of sunshine on a cloudy day as it fills my heart with a giddy joy. I quickly get out of the car and run up to her and hug and kiss her with all my might. I don't understand the very strong and pleasant emotions that fill me. I do really feel like a little girl again that has just come home to mommy. Mom says, 
it's time to come in baby. I reply okay, mom, I have a lot to tell you. She smiles and takes me by the hand. I feel so great as she leads me in. I say excitedly, mom, have you seen how well I have done? I have 15 songs all at number one. Baby Kisses is an all-time greatest hit. Mom smiles softly and pats me on my bottom. I feel so strangely wonderful. She says, that's really nice baby. Your room is ready for you. I have your clothes laid out. Now be a good girl and go up and get ready for your bath. Mommy will be up shortly to help. My head suddenly is buzzing. I now really want to go upstairs and change my clothes. I have been on the road for many hours and a good bath sounds like a great idea. Mom pats me softly on my bottom again. I can't help myself, I giggle sweetly like a little girl as I start to climb the stairs. I don't quite understand, but I am really glad to be home. I come to my bedroom door and open it. Memory returns, this is my nursery. I gasp with disbelief. I am suddenly helpless. I see my crib with my diaper and lined rumba panties. There is a really cute little shorty smock top with puffy sleeves all soft pink. Mommy is behind me and takes my hand gently. She says cooingly as she talks to me like a baby, it's time for baby to come in now. I let you play with your friends and I know you had a good time. It's time for you to have a real dinner and take a nap. I am totally helpless as she leads me into the bathroom. She gently undresses me. The bathwater is already drawn and smells so wonderfully of honeysuckle. She helps me in the tub. I am mind blown as I realize I am not going on any tours. I am baby and mommy has said it's time to come in. Playtime is over and now it's nap time. Her hands caress me so wonderfully. I am loosing my mind as she bathes me from head to foot. I am totally mind blown. I cannot for the life of me figure any of this out. I know I am a baby girl. The memory is so new and fresh. Like I had just realized something I knew all along, but didn't realize I knew. I am even confusing myself. I see mommy take some Johnson & Johnson baby shampoo and pour some of the gel in her hand. Mommy says, don't be afraid baby, this shampoo won't hurt your eyes if you get some in them. I cannot believe it. I actually feel relief in me about the shampoo. Mommy washes my long hair very thoroughly. She says in her cooing voice, we have to get all that adult dirt off of baby and out of her hair. I see the hair color I had in my hair as it comes out into the bathwater along with the makeup I had on. I have white blonde hair again. I now realize why I never had to shave or had a period like all my girlfriends. I am just a baby girl. Mommy had allowed baby to go out and play, it's now time for baby to come in. Mommy helps me up and out of the tub. I can't believe this. I am becoming so helpless and I feel so much like a baby. I am no longer the rock star baby kitten. I am now mommy's baby Amanda. I am suddenly engulfed in a soft, warm, and fuzzy towel. Mommy dries me briskly but softly all over and finishes with my hair. I am suddenly floating through the air and land softly on my back. Mommy rubs her nose to mine and coos softly as she tickles me. I giggle and squirm and kick my feet in sheer joyous euphoria. Mommy kisses me all over. She then lifts me up and puts a soft, thick cloth diaper under me. I lay on my back in helpless realization that mommy is going to diaper me. Her hands caress me so wonderfully as she applies baby powder. The beautiful smell of it is everywhere. I coo softly as she pulls the diaper between my legs and fastens the pins. Mommy says cooingly, baby is too young to undo her diaper pins. When she potties, just let mommy know and I will change you right away. Okay baby. I say in a very sweet voice, yes, mommy. She lifts my feet and puts them through the rumba panties leg openings. She sits me up and pulls them gently up and over my diaper. I lean against mommy helplessly and can't believe it is happening to me. I realize I am sucking my thumb and really do enjoy it. Mommy says in her cooing voice, okay, sweetie, 
take your thumb out of your mouth for a minute and hold your arms up so mommy can get you in your top. I giggle as I take my thumb from my mouth and hold my arms up. Mommy puts my top over my arms and fits the sleeves to my hands. With a soft gentle tug, baby is now in her jammies ready for her nap. Mommy takes me over to a large rocking chair. I am in her lap watching her undo her blouse and bra. She takes one of ample breasts and gives it a gentle squeeze. I see a drop of milk form on the nipple. She puts it to my mouth. I suckle hungrily. I am rewarded with a slightly watery but sweetly rich liquid. I am so content and my tummy is warm with mommy's milk. I am lost in mommy's love and fall slowly asleep. I wake just for an instant and am in my crib all tucked in with Teddy. I am all snuggled up to Teddy as I suck my thumb and go contentedly back to sleep. A phone rings in the den. Mrs. Blake answers the phone. On the other end is the frantic voice of Baby Kitten's manager. He is almost in a psychotic dither. Baby Kitten has been unaccounted for, for seven weeks now. Her music is the number one ever and her fans are demanding more. The music seems to bring people back to much simpler time and relieves all worries and brings on a euphoria better than any drug. Her music cannot be duplicated by anyone. The manager frantically begs, Mrs. Blake, we of earth realize your daughter is still a baby. Please, we all beg of you, let her make this one last tour. Mrs. Blake smiles warmly to herself and replies softly, Mr. Thompson, I agreed to let baby come out and play with you boys and girls. I let her play for two years. It's time for her to be back in her nursery for a while. I do promise that in fifty or sixty years, I will let her come out and play again. The manager is now having a royal psychotic fit, you realize she is in violation of her contractual agreements. Mrs. Blake laughs sweetly and replies in a cooing voice like she is talking to an extremely small child, Mr. Thompson, you are just a baby, we of Alpha Dushi Minor live many thousands of your years. We are very grateful for Earth's hospitality since our ship has been destroyed by your, what did you call them, terrorists. But Amanda is still a baby. She needs to be a baby for a while before I will let her out to play some more. Those contracts, if you bother to read them, have a stipulation that it is up to mother. Understand, I am mother and it's time for baby to come in. Thompson's voice could be heard very plainly across the room as he had his fit. Mrs. Blake says softly, I am sorry baby boy, in about fifty years, if you are still alive, come back and I promise baby can come out and play. Until then. Please have a good day. Mrs. Blake hangs up the phone and cuts off the hysterical tirade of Mr. Thompson. She shakes her head. She still can't believe they have been marooned on a planet full of children. She turns and goes back to the sofa in the den. The news reporter is covering the story of the greatest rock and roll star ever. Baby Kitten Auntie takes sissy shopping. Although working on a market stall each and every Saturday was a bit of a chore. The extra money made it all worth it. Some of my school friends thought I was a dag for having a job. But they were also envious that I had more spending money than they had. They teased me for working on a stall that sold the most horrendous fashions. And on that note. I completely agreed with them. I only sell them, I. Don't wear them. Who does wear them? My friend Gemma asked. I dunno. I shrugged. Girls with no sense of style or no choice in what they wear, I replied. Thank God my mother doesn't stop there. Same here, replied Gemma. Even if my mum did buy me something from your stall. I'd just refuse to wear it. I couldn't agree more as I helped put up the stall on Saturday morning. 
Some of the styles were so horrendous that no one in their right mind would buy them. Let alone wear them. We seem to sell to a lot of aunts and grandmothers buying gifts for nieces and granddaughters. So much so I tend to ask if it's a gift whenever I sell to an unaccompanied adult. Is it for your daughter? I ask one stern-looking lady as she purchases a particularly horrible frock. Normally I follow this with. I'm sure she'll love it. Or. I'm sure she'll look lovely in it, or something like that. However, this particular lady left me completely aghast. Sorry? I asked certain I'd misheard her. Did you say? Yes, she bluntly replied. My nephew is an absolute terror. He's rude and lazy and I'm resorting to petticoating, she explained. Naturally, I asked what petticoating was, eh? Although I had a half-decent idea. Putting naughty boys in prissy dresses until they learn to behave themselves, she replied. I couldn't help but giggle. Well, this is certainly prissy, I said as I folded the dress neatly before putting it in a carrier bag. Have a good day, I said as I handed her the carrier bag. I hope he likes it, I added. I'm banking on him hating it, the lady said as a wry smile swept her face. I couldn't wait to tell Gemma about this particular sale and she couldn't believe it either. Surely she was joking. Gemma insisted as we walked to school the following Monday. Sometimes Debs, you're so gullible, she added. That's what I thought. But she really wasn't. I insisted. I said I hope he likes it, and she said I'm banking on him hating it. We both giggled at the idea of boys being forced to wear dresses. The bullies. The boisterous. The disruptive. But maybe Gemma was right. Maybe I am too gullible and the lady was teasing me. However, the following Saturday as I manned the stall. I noticed a familiar frock amongst the crowd of shoppers. Next to this was a familiar stern face. The same stern face I'd sold the dress to a week earlier. I looked at the dress again and almost balked at its horrendous style. And then at the head above its broad round collar. At first, I was still trying to deny the obvious. Lots of girls have short hair. I thought as the two figures sauntered up the high street. As they got a little closer. I spied lipstick and blusher painted on the most miserable face. And as they got closer still. It was clear that it was in fact a boy wearing what was possibly the most horrendous dress I'd ever sold. As they passed, the lady stopped. She turned the boy towards the stall and said. This is the nice young lady who sold me your dress Peter. I lied and said he looked very nice. The lady told the boy to say thank you, before insisting he curtsy for me. I wanted to burst out laughing. But he looked so humiliated. So ashamed. I simply cast him a supportive smile. The lady told me that hopefully, he won't need another dress. But if he does, we'll be back, she added. I certainly hope so, I replied. Not knowing what else to say. The poor boy's head hung low and he barely gave me or anybody else any eye contact. The lady turned him away and they continued slowly along the high street. It was clear that he was being paraded and shamed. Heads turned. Fingers pointed. Children laughed and giggled. Adults talked in hushed tones. Glancing at the boy in the horrendous dress. I couldn't wait to tell Gemma about it and telephoned her as soon as my day's work was finished. As we walked to school the following Monday. All she wanted to ask me about was the boy in the dress and I was more than happy to describe every last detail. From the lipstick. Blusher and the look of shame on his face. Right down to his lace-trimmed white ankle socks. And black Mary Janes on his feet. In which he uncomfortably yet carefully walked. When we got to our form room. The teacher prepared to call out the register. But first, drew our attention to the new boy in class. This is Peter Jackson, please make him feel welcome, the teacher said as the boy glanced around the rest of the class. He smiled and said hello. But when his eyes met mine. He froze. 
The color drained from his face just as quickly as his jaw dropped. More than anything I wanted to nudge Gemma and whisper that's him. But I chose not to. His first day at a new school must be nerve-wracking enough. Without me stirring things up. I've enjoyed reading your accounts of childhood scrapes and punishments from other people. However, I think my own spanking memory, and actually my earliest childhood memory overall, might be the one of the oldest memories. This happened during the late 1940s. I remember it was a lovely sunny day and I was playing in the back garden of our house in Liverpool. My parents were both dozing in a deck chair each, enjoying the fine weather. I think Dad was reading a newspaper while mom was sipping a cup of tea and neither were paying much attention to me. We had a modest flower bed at the bottom of the garden and it was nearly all in bloom. It looked so lovely that I thought I would pick some flowers for my mum, as I had seen other little girls do. So it was that a few minutes later, I strode up happily to my mother with a bunch of freshly picked flowers of all colours and held them out for her to take. Imagine my horror when instead of being delighted, Mum's face suddenly turned to thunder and she began shouting at me, calling me a naughty little girl. I was upset and confused, but not half as upset as I was a few moments later when Mum put across her knee and given a soundly smacked bottom. I mainly remember two things. First, the roughness of Mum's serge skirt against my tummy and my front bottom, as we girls were taught to call it. Second, of course, I remember the stinging of my mother's hand. Little as I was, she didn't spare me, and by the time my smacking was done, I had a very stinging bottom. My only other memory of it is being sat on mum's lap afterward, still bare and itchy from that skirt, though the buzzing leftover from the smacking was still worse, and being cuddled for a while until I stopped crying, after which I was taken in for an afternoon nap. In retrospect, and by today's standards, the punishment seems very harsh. But as it was explained to me when I got older, at that time food rationing was still strictly enforced. The family garden was mostly given over to producing food and I think mum believed that if I wasn't immediately disciplined, there was a chance I would subsequently pull up vegetables or pick fruit which was much needed to feed a hungry family. Growing up is hard to do. Peter's childhood was relatively normal, he played army with his friends, climbed trees, had a train set and loads of action figures and liked nothing more than his trusty old jeans with a hole in the knee, a zip-up hoodie and his thoroughly worn-in trainers. His mother, Helen, is an architect and his father worked part-time in a biscuit factory. Helen often told her husband that he could give up work as her wage alone could easily support their family but he was proud to work and wished he could get more hours and maybe even a promotion. But with more women in the boardroom, more women get promoted and as such, Peter's dad had been stuck on the shop floor for years whilst his mother's career went from strength to strength. 
When Peter was seven years old his father became permanently stuck to the shop floor when a section of racking collapsed, tragically killing him on the spot. Ever since that day, Peter has been raised solely by his mother. With the support of his family and teachers, Peter fared relatively well with the loss of his father. The nearest thing Peter had to a father figure in his junior years was Ron Blakely, a widower in his fifties. Mum called him the handyman but mostly he hoovers and irons, dusts and washes up. He used to be a proper handyman but as the work dried up for him, he diversified into a more domestic realm as that was one area which the women weren't taking over. Even then, Ron found it hard to earn enough to support himself as more and more men were being laid off, leaving them plenty of time to tend to such chores. In my day they used to call them kept men, if a bloke didn't have a job he was a sponger, too lazy to work, these days they call them stay-at-home husbands and it's supposed to be a good thing, times change lad, times change. Ron said to an eight-year-old Peter. Ron had to give up working altogether due to ill health and since then the ironing and laundry has been done by an agency, run by women, worked by men. Between the two of them, Peter and his mother kept on top of the hoovering and dusting. Peter's mother gave him the freedom to strive to be all he could be and encouraged him to try his best, even if you're not very good at something, your best is good enough, she used to tell him. Like most boys, Peter had an average academic record and like most boys, Peter sat towards the back of the class. In order to provide a solid education for the brightest kids, classrooms are ordered with the highest marks towards the front and the lower marks towards the back. Peter didn't feel bad about always ending up towards the back of the class as low marks weren't really frowned upon if you were a boy. However if a girl ended up in the back half of the class, she'd be given a level of help and attention that the boys never received. Of course there were some boys who were up there with the girls in the first three rows, but no more than a handful. Girls were simply better at schoolwork and as such, their prospects are of far greater importance. The shift from male to female dominance in the workplace meant there was little need to push the boys towards academic excellence. Peter was in his final year of junior school when he first heard the phrase genderquake. He didn't know what it meant, but like earthquake or starquake, it sounded exciting. He asked his mother what it meant and was unimpressed by the reply. It simply refers to the fact that more women have jobs than men, that women get paid more than men and that more men stay at home and do the housework than women. Not so long ago it was quite the opposite. I thought it was going to be like an earthquake or something. Peter said. He recalled being equally unimpressed when he found out what a skyscraper really was. He'd heard the phrase previously and visualized a huge machine, towering above cities, trundling along on giant caterpillar tracks and literally scraping the sky, so realizing it was just a tall tower block was a bit of a letdown, anyway. One day Peter comes home from school and tells his mother that there was a boy at school wearing a girl's dress. I don't think that's true Peter, his mother said. Honest mum it is true. Peter insisted, before naming the boy and describing the dress he was wearing. We were teasing him but the teacher told us we mustn't. Well it's not nice to tease people Peter, you know that, his mother said. Now, are you certain he was wearing a girl's dress, she asked. Ah, uh, thought Peter, well, yes, it was a dress, like girls wear. His mother grinned before informing him that not many girls wear dresses these days Peter, and they do make them for boys too. What? Peter thought. Boys don't wear dresses. Well you know one boy that does, his mother states matter-of-factly. And I'm sure he was wearing a boy's dress and not one made for a girl. The concept of dresses for boys was as new to Peter as it was most people. His mother was only aware of the changing fashion due to an article on Radio 4's Woman's Hour a month or so previously. Like many boys, Peter was adamant that he'd never wear a dress, and his mother was fine with that. Many people figured the trend of dresses for boys would, like most fashion trends, disappear as quickly as it came. Although seeing boys in dresses was a rare sight, the pages of many women's magazines were home to plenty of adverts and articles, either promoting or discussing the trend. This side effect of the gender quake didn't snowball into something massive overnight, but it didn't burn out and fade away either. 
Over the following year or so the trend just seemed to trundle on, wallowing in its mediocrity, a bit like a punk rocker, we still see one occasionally but they don't shock or offend anymore, they just are. Of course there were signs of this inevitable side effect, but only in hindsight. As girls began almost entirely wearing trousers for school, boys gradually began wearing trousers of a similar style, being lycra and tight fitting down to the knee, then flaring into a boot cut. This led to VPL issues for boys and as a result, underwear with an invisible hem became available for them. When fashion veteran Jean Paul Gaultier introduced the reverse shirt, a formal shirt for men with a flat front, split collar and buttons up the back. It broke decades of traditional front-fastening shirts being the only choice and quickly gained a firm foothold in mainstream male attire. Around the same time, boys' and men's t-shirts adopted the ruffled hem, which was rebranded the rough and ready hem. Yet another subtle indicator of what was around the corner was the ubiquity of boys and men having both ears pierced. It wasn't too many years ago when the seaside resorts of Brighton, Bournemouth and Torquay introduced bylaws making it an offence for men to bare their chests in public places. This, for the most part didn't include public swimming pools but most certainly applied to beach fronts, promenades, shopping precincts and public parks. This legislation proved popular amongst the moral majority and soon spread inland before being covered by national decency laws. Whilst most men simply complied and kept their shirt on, some began wearing crop tops, strappy tops, halter necks, camera style vests, even boob tubes and skimpy bikini tops were adopted in order to get maximum exposure without risking a fine for indecency. Tilda O, O, O Tilda. Peter and his mother were on holiday with his aunt Joe, uncle George and cousins, James and Michael, aged 9 and 13 respectively. Peter couldn't help but snigger when James wore a pretty dress for a day to the seaside. Michael wore his boy clothes but did admit to having a couple of dresses too. I don't like them. Michael insisted. But I have to wear one when mum wants me to look nice. Peter, now twelve and a half is flabbergasted. Even if mum did buy me a dress. I wouldn't wear it, no way. Michael is somewhat surprised that Peter doesn't have one, I think every lad I know has at least one dress. Michael states, but most of them don't like having to wear them. I'm not surprised. I think it's pretty rotten making you wear something you don't like. Peter replies. Yeah I suppose. James likes them. I noticed. Peter replies, glancing at James who walks with Peter's mother, chatting away. I'd hate to dress like that all the time. He doesn't wear them all the time. Michael says, defending his younger brother. Later, they stop for a bite to eat in a seafront cafe. Peter's mother says doesn't James look nice in his dress Peter? I guess. Peter replies as he thinks the exact opposite. So have you got many dresses Peter? Aunt Jo asks. She is genuinely surprised when he tells her he hasn't got any. Why not? Peter shrugs, I don't like them he replies. Well neither does Michael but. She turns to her eldest son, you'll wear one occasionally won't you? Michael gulps and nods. I keep thinking about buying George one too, she adds, casting a smile at her husband. Uncle George claims he's too old. Dresses are okay for boys, but not grown men. He is accused of being a stick in the mud, before his wife points out that in ten years' time both James and Michael will be grown men and there's a strong likelihood that most men will be wearing skirts and dresses by then. Peter's mother agrees with her sister-in-law, but adds, I couldn't imagine George in a dress. Before saying that she could imagine Peter in one. A look of horror sweeps her son's face at this revelation. His mother casts him a smile. Don't worry Peter. I'll only buy you one if you want one. Phew, thought Peter. Why don't you come shopping tomorrow with James and I tomorrow, his aunt suggests, turning to her youngest and smiling. You could try a couple on to see if you like it, you never know. Um. Peter stammers, looking nervously from his aunt to his mother, then to his young cousin. I'd rather go fishing with Uncle George and Michael, if that's okay. Of course Peter, his aunt smiles. 
But you can't fight progress, all boys are going to find themselves in dresses sooner or later, and you're no exception. The following day, Peter, Michael and Uncle George go fishing. Peter's mother, Aunt and James go shopping. They browse aisles and aisles of dresses in the boys' department and James tries so many on he gets dizzy. Aunt Jo points out a number of styles that would be perfect for Peter, but his mother thinks it should be his decision. She tells Helen that she just went out and bought their first dresses and made damn sure that they wore them. Both were dead against them at first. Jo explains glancing at her son, James, clearly loves them now, and Michael reluctantly accepts them, if I tell him to wear a dress he'll wear one, she adds. He probably won't like it but. Oh Jo that's a bit mean don't you think? Helen says to her sister-in-law. I don't think so, was it mean when our mothers insisted we wore a pretty dress on a particular occasion? Jo asked. I mean, she added, cocking her head, the old, because we're girls argument doesn't wash any more. I know I know you're right. Helen replied. Her eyes flicked across rows and rows of dresses. I'd have to fight him into any of these, she said, removing one and admiring it, and if it does turn out to be a passing fad, I'd worry that he'd hate me forever, she said, replacing the dress. I think it's best to leave it up to him and see how things pan out. Believe me, this isn't a passing fad, her sister-in-law replied. It's been going on for years, but it's only in the last year or two that it's gained mainstream exposure. Meanwhile on the fishing trip, Michael has gone to the toilet, leaving Peter and his uncle alone. His uncle says your aunt is quite surprised that your mother hasn't bought you a dress yet. Peter asks his uncle if he thinks all boys will be in dresses eventually as Aunt Jo claimed the previous day. You know ten years ago, I'd have loved to have been a boy again. Uncle George reminisces, but these days, I don't envy you, he reluctantly admits. My honest answer is yes. If I thought for one moment it was just a passing fad, I'd never have let your aunt put my boys in dresses, but times are changing lad, and they don't look so bad in them, he adds. You'll get used to it. It just seems so unfair. I mean, it's okay for James because he likes them, but Mike doesn't and he still has to wear them sometimes. Peter says. Well from time to time we all have to wear something we don't like. Uncle George glances down the track to make sure Michael isn't in earshot. There's no sign so he turns back to his nephew and says, but Michael likes some more than others. Uncle George says, I expect you'll get your turn soon enough lad, and it won't be as bad as you think. I hope not. Peter replies. When they return to the holiday cottage, James shows off his new frock and Peter is relieved that his mother hadn't decided to buy him one anyway, a thought which had lingered in the back of his mind all day long. Over the course of the week-long holiday, James wore a dress most days. Michael wore one of his on two occasions, the day they visited Cricklay Hall and the evening they went to a posh restaurant for a slap-up meal. Of course the subject of boys in dresses and the gender quake came up on many occasions. Peter's mother continued to feel that dresses for boys was just a passing fad and would all be in the past before long, but his aunt felt quite the opposite, and rather eloquently explained how the roles of males and females were being irrevocably reversed. Uncle George takes the boys for a day of go-kart racing on the last full day of their holiday, it's one of the few days James wears traditional boys' clothes. As Helen and Joe wave them off, Helen says, it seems strange seeing James in jeans. I'd got so used to him wearing one of his dresses. He wears them often enough. Joe replies, he loves his frocks but if he thinks he might get one dirty he'll sacrifice a pair of his old pants instead. So, how did you go about it, when you bought them their first dresses? Helen asks. Do they choose their own or do you always buy for them? At first I just bought them one each and insisted they wore them, they were both reluctant, but once it was on, James took to it like a duck to water. Michael was more hesitant, and still is, but after I'd bought him three or four really prissy dresses, he soon decided to become more proactive in choosing his own, and believe me, he'd much rather wear a dress that he'd picked over one of my choices, she explained. Are you thinking of taking the plunge with Peter? Well, if it doesn't turn out to be a passing fad, 
I suppose I'll have to sooner or later. I just want to do it properly and avoid traumatizing him. I really don't think he'll be traumatized if you buy him a dress, it's only an item of clothing. Joe replies. I read an article in Good Parenting magazine about parents starting their boys off lightly, buying say a plain blue frock to start with, and gradually working them up to prissy pink party dress. Well that sounds logical. Peter's mother says. I may sound logical but it doesn't work like that, if they hate the plain blue frock then the likelihood of them even accepting the more prissy styles is virtually nil, she replied, the best bet is to start them off with a really pretty frock, all satin, and bows and frills, preferably in pink or peach, once he's worn that a few times, you'll have no problem putting him in something a little less fussy. Tilda oh, oh, oh Tilda. Over the course of the next six months, Peter's mother takes more of an interest in the gender quake, and its potential consequences for her son. She'd read articles about changing trends in magazines, about men becoming the underdog, boys becoming like girls used to be and the future of the male role in both society and the home. One article in particular grabbed her attention, putting boys in dresses the easy way, which described a variety of approaches. Lower him in slowly with the occasional Sunday dress, present a routine with a skirt for school and traditional boy clothes the rest of the time, or throw them in at the deep end and take away all of their old boy clothes. The article concluded by weighting up the pros and cons of the different methods, but stressed the necessity clearly enough, an uninitiated boy will never find a decent wife to support him. Peter and his mother are shopping and notice the mannequins of boys wearing dresses in shop window displays are becoming more and more ubiquitous. They go into a department store and notice that the boys' department is now half dresses, and the girls' department has only a tiny selection of skirts and frocks. It hardly seems like a year since the first small selection of dresses for boys was introduced to the high street. Why are we going down here? Peter asks as his mother takes him into the dress section of the boys' department. She insists it's just for a look, and that he just might see one he likes. He insists he won't, but that doesn't stop her from holding a few against him. An assistant approaches and knowingly asks if they're shopping for his first dress. His mother says they're just looking. Peter says he doesn't want one, and draws her attention to the new pair of jeans and t-shirts he's got. The assistant smiles and says and in a friendly, diplomatic manner that it won't be too long before he'd have to go to the girls' department for those. And you wouldn't want to buy clothes from the girls' department would you, she smiles, before pointing out a candy pink Lolita dress and tell his mother that this is a good starter. Yes, so I understand, his mother replies. It is very nice, but also very expensive. Especially since he doesn't like dresses, she adds. Peter is relieved to finally leave the store with just his new jeans and t-shirts, but is becoming increasingly worried about the future. The days weeks and months slips by. One Saturday afternoon, Peter is out with his friends whilst his mother spends the afternoon reading the paper with Radio 4 on in the background. On hearing an article about the gender quake being introduced, she puts down her paper and turns up the volume. Presenter it was barely three years ago when John Lewis's introduced their first range of dresses for boys, bringing the trend out of the backstreet boutiques of the larger cities to the high streets of towns and cities of all sizes, we've been speaking to the marketing director of Debenhams, whose new TV ad campaign for their new range of boys' dresses has already caused controversy. Guest, it's simple economics, little girls no longer dream of being a princess, they want a career, a house, a car, children, and a husband. We've all seen it in our daughters and nieces for decades, they're just not interested in being pretty anymore. Ask yourself, when was the last time a little girl wanted a My Little Pony, a Tinker Bell duvet cover or a Disney Princess DVD? If anybody can remember those things. The fact of the matter is, we have dresses, we know how to make dresses and I think as a society, we like dresses, they're not going away, what I'm trying to say is, now that girls on the whole don't wear dresses, it makes perfect economic sense to market them to the boys instead. And nobody can argue that they're not catching on. Presenter, what started in the children's department is now, albeit slowly, making its way to the men's department, with skirts, frocks, heels and hosiery now widely available in, amongst others, 
Burton, top man, Greenwoods, sales are reportedly and understandably slow. Do you think it's too much for most men? Is this why sales of such items are practically non-existent? Guest, of course it's too much for most men, today. But in spite of the rumors that all boys hate dresses and it's their mothers playing dolls, many boys love their dresses, they love being pretty, and those boys are going to grow up, so it's essential that Debenhams and the chains you've mentioned are there for them. Presenter, so, the future, in say 50 or 80 years time, do you think boys will be playing with dolls and dreaming of being a princess? Guest, laughs, well they'll certainly be playing with dolls because that's essential for learning child care, dreaming of being a princess. A prince maybe, but it'll be a prince in a beautiful long gown with long gorgeous hair waiting for a princess to come to his rescue. Presenter, total role reversal. Guest, exactly. Presenter. Well that concludes Weekend Women's R for this week, I'd like to thank Jane Peterson of Debenhams. We'll be back at 10am on Monday when we hear from 12-year-old Laura who's part of a dying breed, the girly girl. Tilda oh, oh, oh Tilda. As Peter's birthday neared, he got more and more excited about becoming a teenager, 13 sounds so much cooler than boring old monosyllabic 12. However his enthusiasm ebbed when his mother told him that she'd decided the time was right to buy him his first dress. But I don't want to dress mum, you know I hate dresses. But lots of boys wear dresses Peter, you want to fit in don't you, his mother argued. No they don't. Peter insisted, knowing full that those who did wear dresses were a definite minority. Oh come on Peter you know they do, you said yourself that there's three boys in your class who wear skirts. Yeah, and like ten others who don't. Peter insisted. And next term it'll be five against eight, then half and half. The way things are going, this time next year you'll probably be the only one left if you wore trousers, she explained. What do you mean if I wore trousers? His mother became a little nervous and made a few false starts. Well, once you er, uh, um, well, she stopped and started again. What I'm trying to say is, once you've got used to wearing dresses. I promise you. I won't. Peter insisted. Of course you will, she replies. She then goes on to explain about some of the articles she's read. Now I'm not saying this is going to be easy, and I understand why you're fighting it. Any boy would. But you have to understand that it's a women's world now, we wear the trousers. But why should that mean that I have to become a girl? Peter retorted. You're not becoming a girl love, the roles are reversing, now it's your turn to be pretty, she smiles. And believe me Peter, it's nowhere near as bad as you think it is. I'm sure it will be. Well you'll never know until you've tried, his mother smiled. She made him a drink and placed it on the coffee table for him. She picked up one of her magazines, flicked through it and found the page then passed it to Peter. I know you won't like any of them, but have a flick through anyway, see if there's a best of the bad bunch eh? The images in front of Peter horrified him. Dresses for boys his age are like dresses for eight-year-old girls used to be, all frills and ruffles and lace and bows. Page after page he went, hating each and every one of them. As a result, he offered his mother no help in choosing his first dress. It was three days before Peter's birthday when his mother proudly stated that she'd bought him his first dress. He tried his best to get out of trying it on, but his mother insisted, claiming that if it was the wrong size she'd have to take it back. So reluctantly Peter wore the dress, hoping with all his being that it would be the wrong size and therefore returned. That's perfect, his mother said, stepping back and looking him up and down. How does it feel? Peter looked down at himself, clad in pink satin with a big white bow. Horrible. Can I take it off? he asked. Please, he added. His mother said he had to try his new shoes first, and much to his displeasure, presented him with a pair of pink satin pumps and thin white ankle socks. Once fully dressed, his mother stepped back and smiled at him lovingly. You're going to look so nice on Sunday, she said, before planting a white ribbon on his head. Peter gulped and looked at his reflection. I'm not wearing this on Sunday mum, he said. 
It's my birthday and all my friends. Will be wearing dresses too, his mother interrupted. No they won't. None of my friends wear dresses, he insisted. Peter darling. I put a dress code on the invite stating that boys must attend wearing party dresses. Peter claims she's going to ruin his life, that none his friends will come and they'll think he's turning girly, but his mother tells him that Simon's mother and John's mother have already replied, and they will be attending in dresses, as will his cousins James and Michael, and Nigel from down the road. You'll wear what you're told to young man. Courtesy of Jamie Vester. But, I don't want to wear a dress mum, you know I don't, and definitely not a pink one. You're thirteen Peter and you'll wear what you're told to young man, she insisted. Times are changing and it's high time you started dressing your gender, she spouts. When was the last time you saw a girl wearing a dress? Loads of girls wear dresses. Peter replied as he pondered his mother's question. Like her, he visualized all the girls in his class, Joanne King, he said, knowing she was the only girl who still wore a skirt, and the other girls give her grief for it. Well she may well still wear a skirt for school, but does she wear dresses too? his mother asked. Peter hung his head. Maybe. Peter, she said calmly, placing her hands on his shoulders and thumbing the satin sleeves. I understand that you're instinctively fighting this, but the fact of the matter is, boys wear dresses these days, you only have to walk into any department store to work that out. Peter slumps on his bed, and is warned by his mother not to crease his dress. He asks if he can take it off and she lets him. He pulls on his pants and t-shirt as his mother puts his dress on a hanger and places it in his wardrobe. From that moment on, Peter dreads his rapidly approaching birthday and the dress he'll be wearing for the party. Tilda oh, oh, oh Tilda. On the morning of Peter's birthday, his mother makes him a special breakfast and lets him open his presents, he gets a book and a DVD, a couple of music CDS, a rather humiliating Hello Kitty bath set, containing bubble bath, shower gel, soap, shampoo, conditioner, a pink puff and a couple of bath bombs. And last but not least, he unwraps another party dress, virtually identical to his pink one only in blue. Another dress, he hesitantly asks. His mother tells him that she'd overheard him in his bedroom, wishing that I'd bought you a blue one instead, she smiles. Peter tidies up the wrapping paper and takes his frock and other gifts to his room before running the bath. As the tub fills, his mother enters with his Hello Kitty bath set. She removes the lid from the bubble bath and pours a little under the tap. As the bubbles begin to foam a pungent smell fills Peter's nostrils. What's that smell? he asks. It's it's nice isn't it? she replies as she agitates the surface, creating even more bubbles. I don't like it, he replies. It smells like perfume. Well you'd better get used to it Peter because after your bath, you'll smell exactly the same, she says as she lines up his new Hello Kitty toiletries on the side of the bath. I'm not getting in if I'm going to smell like that. Peter moans. Peter I'm getting a little tired of your constant moaning. If you're going to act like a child I'll treat you like one. This spurs a minor tantrum from Peter, which his mother counters by threatening to cancel his birthday party. Instead I'll take you shopping for a new school skirt which you will be wearing tomorrow and every day after that. With that, Peter concedes and steps into the bubbles. His mother plunges the pink puff into the water before squeezing some of the shower gel onto it. She then proceeds to bath him whilst Peter protests he's old enough to bath himself. Like I said Peter, if you're going to act like a five-year-old I'm going to treat you like one, she says as she proceeds to wash his body and hair. Once his mother is satisfied that he's clean, she leaves him alone to dry himself off. Peter sniffs his skin and screws his nose up as the fruity scent fills his nostrils. He wraps the towel around himself and returns to his bedroom where his mother and his party dress are waiting for him. She passes him his new nice underpants, which for all intents and purposes are a pair of girls' knickers with lace trim around the waist and legs. They're blue to match his dress, as is the vest he pulls on. His mother runs the towel through his hair before brushing it. Um, you smell beautiful Peter, she says. Are you ready to try your dress on? Peter gulps and looks at his dress. 
He sulks then nods. His mother smiles and picks it up before pulling down the zip, seemingly in slow motion. She holds it open whilst Peter reluctantly steps into it and pushes his arms through the short sleeves. His mother turns him around and slowly pulls up the zip, before turning him to face her. A broad smile beams down on him and he feels himself blush. His mother places a headband in his hair with a large white satin bow attached, before digging deep into her pocket and removing a tube of lip gloss. Open, she says as she waves the wand close to his chin. Peter moans about the lipstick, but she tells him it's lip gloss. He drops his jaw and she carefully applies it. Once done, she steps back and grins. I should have done this years ago, she says. I think boys were born to wear dresses, it's a wonder it took us so long to realize. Image adapted from an original. By Jamie Vester. Once Peter has his shoes and socks on, his mother takes him to her bedroom so he can see how he looks in her large mirror. Doesn't it look delightful, she gushes. Peter gulps as he takes in his reflection. I can't believe you're making me wear this on my birthday, he says before begging his mother to let him wear something else. It's a party dress Peter, and you're having a party, it's perfect, she replies. But if you really don't like it, she says as he becomes visibly hopeful, there's always the pink one if you prefer. Peter looks back to the mirror and decides to keep the blue one on. I thought you might, his mother smiles knowingly. Now you've got to be very careful not to get any cake, chocolate, juice or jelly on it, otherwise you'll have to wear the pink one, she states. Come the party, only two of his six friends invited from school turn up, both wearing party dresses. His cousins James and Michael come too, also in pretty dresses. One of the boys from down the road who often wears dresses is also invited, along with a few girls from the neighborhood, none of whom wear dresses. Each of his guests give him a birthday card and almost all of them would have been perfect for a girl only a decade ago, butterflies, boughs, flowers, and cute animals in pink, purple and lilac shades. Each of his guests also bears a gift, but these are for after they've eaten. The tea party style buffet is hugely uncomfortable for Peter. He's never seen his two schoolmates in frocks before and although he's glad they came, he'd hope they wouldn't. After some inquiring from the grown-ups, Simon admits he has a variety of dresses, whilst John reluctantly tells them it's his first one. His mother had bought it specially for the party and is clearly just as uncomfortable as Peter. After the jelly and ice cream, each of Peter's guests give him their gifts. Thankfully they're all good for a boy and not girly things like his mother bought him. Then, his mother says she's got one more surprise for him, and presents an unexpected gift. Peter reluctantly opens it, hoping it's not going to embarrass him. Having a big white ribbon tied around the pink and purple spotted paper he quite rightly fears the worst, but as the paper comes off, his fears are put to rest. A Nintendo Wii 3. Wow, he exclaims as his guests pull similar faces of excitement. From that moment on his dull sissy party became round after round of video bowling, tennis, racing games, and the like. Peter almost forgot he was wearing a dress, almost. Once the party was over and all his guests had gone, his mother asked if he'd enjoyed himself. Yeah. The Wii 3 is awesome, he replied, adding a thank you. Well I'm glad, and wearing a dress isn't that bad is it? Peter screwed his face up. Well, he looked down at himself. I'd have preferred it if I'd worn my pants. Then you'd have been dressed like one of the girls, his mother smiled before saying, plus once you were playing your video games you'd forgotten all about your dress. No because when I was bowling it kept getting in the way, he replied, miming the action to demonstrate how his voluminous skirt gets in the way. You soon managed to work around it, his mother grinned. And you did get plenty of strikes, she reminded him. And next time you wear it you won't feel quite so self-conscious. Next time he frowned. You didn't think you'd only have to wear it today did you? Um. Yes. She grinned and shook her head at his ignorance. I didn't spend a fortune on dresses only for you to wear them once Peter, she told him, before explaining that she wanted him to wear one every Sunday. Peter moaned but his mother warned him. 
Some boys have to wear them every day Peter, so think yourself lucky it's only once a week, she asked him if he understood and he nodded. Come on, I'm sure you're just dying to get out of it, she said with a smile. He follows her to his bedroom and suspects something as she pauses at the door. Your Auntie Jo has one more birthday surprise for you. She says before gesturing him inside. Instead of one of his usual duvet covers, his bed is clad in a new one, baby pink with butterflies on it. Isn't it lovely, she asks. Knowing it's a gift from his auntie is no option but to appear grateful. There's some new gym jams under your pillow, she tells him. Peter hesitantly lifts the pillow to reveal a pair of pale purple pyjamas with frills here and there and flower-shaped buttons. Are these from Auntie Jo too? he asked. No they're from me, she replies. I thought you'd prefer gym jams to a nighty. Oh mu um, he moaned as his cheeks blushed to a deep rouge. You're turning me into a girl. On the contrary Peter, she replied as she picked up his new pyjama top, holding it by its short puffed sleeves, I'm turning you into a boy. Girls don't wear things like this anymore. When Peter awoke the following morning, he thought for a split second that he'd had the most peculiar dream. But as he pulled his eyelids open and his vision cleared, he realized it was all real. Sitting at the kitchen table wearing his girly pajamas was humiliating beyond belief, but that was nothing in comparison to the reception he got at school. He was teased by many of his classmates for having a sissy birthday party and no matter how much he wished, he could not deny that fact. One of the girls asked him what color his dress was. Blue, he replied. Then she asked him if he liked it. No, he retorted. My mum made me wear it. And good for her, his teacher said in a loud voice. Like it or not boys, we're living in an age of change and before long you'll all be in skirts and dresses. As most of the boys were yet to be introduced to the new trend, they denied that day would come. But Peter, along with a handful more had first-hand experience of how the times were changing and quite rightly believed otherwise. As usual, his mother asked him if he'd had a nice day at school. Peter said it was okay but added that some of the boys teased him about his birthday party. His mother insisted they were simply jealous because they can't wear pretty dresses, but this, Peter could not believe. He went to his room to change out of his school uniform. His heart sank when he opened his bedroom door. Why this is supposed to be acceptable for boys I'll never know, he thought as he sat down on his new pink duvet cover with its frilly lace trim and butterfly pattern. On his pillow his mother had neatly folded his new frilly lilac pyjamas ready for tonight. Tilda oh, oh, oh Tilda. The following weekend, they go to visit Peter's granny. Peter was fine with this until his mother tells him that he'll be wearing his pink dress. Peter pleaded with her to let him go in his boy clothes. I don't know how many times I have to tell you Peter, he mother stated, dresses are boys' clothes these days. But please mum, not the pink one, can't I wear my blue one instead? Well you wore that for your party last week, his mother replied. I didn't buy it just to hang in your wardrobe. But. I'll wear it next week, please can I wear my blue one? His mother sighed impatiently. Peter, she said sternly, pink dress, whether you like it or not. I'm sure your cousin Michael doesn't sulk and moan every time he has to wear a dress. Ah, uh -huh, he exclaimed before taking his pink dress off its hanger. Once he was dressed his mother told him how nice he looked, before completing his outfit with a pink headband. Do you have to wear a headband too, he asked. Well you want to look nice don't you, his mother replied. Not really. Well I want you to look nice, she stated as she arranged his hair around his headband. She then told him to close his eyes before spraying his entire head with hairspray. What's that? It stinks. It's to keep your hair in place, so make sure you don't touch it. It was an hour's drive to his grandmother's house and Peter felt like a meringue as he sat in the passenger seat with his petticoats piled on his lap. His grandmother told him he looked very pretty but added that it was very strange seeing boys in dresses instead of girls. I think it's a shame that girls don't wear dresses anymore. I used to like wearing dresses but your mother never did, his grandmother reminisced. 
I had to fight her into a dress every time I wanted her to look nice. Just as I'm having to battle Peter into his, his mother replied. It's worth it though, he does look adorable, she added, before showing her mother some photographs from his birthday party the previous weekend. You remember James and Michael, she said, pointing them out. And these are two of Peter's friends from school, and that's Nigel, a boy from down the road. Oh my, they all look so nice, his granny said as she flicked through the photographs. Well now is as good a time as any to give you your birthday present, she said, pulling a bundle of gift-wrapped parcels from besides her chair. I do hope you like them. Peter said thank you as he took the bundle, wrapped in pale pink paper with a bright pink bow around each parcel. He untied the ribbon of the first and smallest gift before removing the paper. Oh that's very nice, his mother said as Peter unwrapped a nightdress. It was white with pink trim and came with a matching pair of knickers. You haven't got a nighty have you? Being in polite mode, Peter thanked his grandmother and told her that he liked it very much, before unwrapping the next gift. This time it was a pair of white satin slippers, each with a single pink bow. Peter forced a smile and said thank you, before unwrapping the final gift, a pale pink dressing gown with white trim that perfectly complemented his slippers and nighty. Again, Peter did the right thing and said thank you. His granny said he was welcome, and added, it's a good job you like pink isn't it? Peter wanted so much to put her straight, but that would have been rude. He is after all wearing a pink dress with pink shoes and has a pink headband in his hair, so he can hardly start claiming otherwise. Peter just smiled and blushed. So what else did you get for your birthday? she asked. Peter told her about the Nintendo Wii 3, the books and CDS he'd been given, along with the bits and bobs his guests had given him. And with a little prompting from his mother, the blue dress he wore for his party, his pyjamas, his new duvet set and the Hello Kitty bath set which made him smell nice. She must think I'm such a sissy, he thought as he pretended to like each and every one of them. Granny couldn't stop looking at her grandson. She'd never seen him in a dress before and in her day boys were positively discouraged from wearing dresses, even if they wanted to. The poor thing looks just as uncomfortable as his mother did when she was a girl, his grandmother thought, she hated looking pretty and wearing dresses in equal measure. As far as his grandmother was concerned, dresses were just something pretty that girls wore, but for his mother they were at best humbling and at worst humiliating. Quite when they became considered a symbol of subservience his grandmother wasn't sure, but that shift in perception was responsible for them slipping out of popularity with her daughter's generation, that she was sure of. On the way home, Peter's mother compliments him on his behaviour today. I think Granny was pleased that you'd worn your dress for her, she says. And didn't you get some lovely gifts? Peter looks at his lap clad in pink satin which almost levitates above his legs thanks to the petticoat beneath. I guess. It just feels weird being given girly stuff all of a sudden, he replied. It's not really girly stuff though is it, his mother replied, you know that. You know what I mean though. Peter replied. Granny said when she was young only girls wore dresses and boys didn't. Even if they wanted to they couldn't because only girls wore dresses. Well, your grandmother is from a time when women were subservient to men. Girls didn't wear dresses because they were girls, they wore them because they were subservient, she explained, and now that men are subservient to women, it's your turn. Hum. Peter groaned. He'd heard the reasoning behind it so many times but it still wasn't right or fair. Why can't we be subsi, subsir? Subservient, his mother corrected subservient and wear pants. Because pants don't look as nice, she said in a matter-of-fact tone, and it's important to look nice because when you're older you'll need to find a wife to support you, she adds. I could support myself. Peter replied. It's getting harder and harder for men to support themselves Peter. There's not many jobs for them and those there are aren't well paid or full-time, she explained. Even university graduates struggle to get anything better than an admin job, the best you could hope for would be domestic service, or a wife with a decent career. Words like graduate, admin, and domestic meant little to Peter so his mother's words went in one ear and out of the other. 
He just wondered why something so weird was supposedly so normal all of a sudden. At least it's only once a week, he thought as they pulled onto the driveway. As Peter went to open the door his mother said not yet Peter, I'll let you out, you did it all wrong at Granny's. Eh? Peter thought as his mother jogged round to his side and opened the door for him. Now you don't just climb out as if you're wearing pants Peter, she said, before explaining that he should keep his knees and ankles together and twist on his seat, then put your feet down and, she watches him alight the car in the proper manner, very good. Why do I have to do it like that, he asked. So nobody sees up your dress, his mother replied with a grin. Oh. Peter replied as his mother unlocked the front door. Can I change, he asked the moment he was inside. It's Sunday Peter, you wear a dress on Sundays and that means all day, she reminds him. It wouldn't be so bad if it was my blue one, he sulked. Oh but you look so nice in pink, his mother teased before planting a kiss on his forehead. A few hours later it was bath time and Peter was finally allowed out of his Sunday dress. Unfortunately for Peter his mother suggested he tries on his new night clothes. He complained that the nightie was too short, but his mother said, that's why it comes with knickers. I know but, he looks at his reflection and raises his arms, which in turn raises the nightie which in turn, reveals the frilly knickers that come with it. You're not supposed to see them. It's fine, his mother insists. It's supposed to be short because it's a summer nightie, come winter I'll buy you a longer one. After school the following day, Peter writes his grandmother a thank you letter. With his mother's guidance it reads. Dear Granny. Thank you very much for the nighty, slippers, and dressing gown. I slept in the nighty last night and it was very comfortable. The slippers are a perfect fit and the dressing gown is really snug and warm. Lots of love, Peter. Tilda oh, oh. Oh Tilda. Over the next couple of months, Peter's mother buys him a couple more nighties and nice PJs, along with another nice duvet cover. His old plain pajamas are a thing of the past, as are his old duvet covers. He soon gets accustomed to sleeping in pink just as much as he gets used to wearing his Sunday dress. His mother extends his wardrobe with a third satin party dress, this time in peach, along with a yellow gingham prairie style dress and a few more packs of nice underpants and vests to wear with them. One day after school they go to visit his auntie Jo, uncle George and cousins Michael and James. Peter is surprised to see that Michael is now wearing a skirt for school, and his aunt is equally surprised that Peter is still wearing pants. Peter's mother tells Michael that his uniform looks nice, before gushing over James whose hair is now in ringlets. It's such a lovely evening that they decide to go and eat out there's a lovely pub by the river. Aunt Jo suggests before telling her sons to go and put something nice on. Peter's mother says I'd have brought one of yours if I'd known we were eating out. Well he can borrow one of Michael's, they'll be about the same size. Aunt Jo suggests. Peter tries to get out of it, but soon finds himself climbing the stairs to his cousin's bedroom to borrow one of his dresses. Come in. Michael calls after hearing a knock on his door. Peter pushes the door open to find his cousin sitting at his dressing table tying a ribbon in his hair, wearing only his underwear. Peter apologizes and begins to exit. It's okay Pete. I am decent. Michael says as he stands up. Peter is embarrassed and doesn't know where to look. Michael is only wearing a short white slip with lace trim and thin white tights. He removes a dress from a hanger. Do you want to borrow a frock? He asks as he steps into his dress. Peter gulps. Well. I don't want to but, mum insisted. Michael pushes his arms into the sleeves of his dress before opening his wardrobe. Help yourself, he says as he reveals a resplendent display. Don't you have any boy's clothes anymore? Peter asks, realizing his wardrobe is end-to-end -end skirts blouses, jumpers and dresses. Well, Michael begins apprehensively as he fiddles behind his back to fasten his zip, I suppose technically I've got a wardrobe full. Mum got sick of me dressing like a girl all the time so got rid of all my pants. Don't they realise that pants should be for us and all this stuff should be for girls? Peter retorts as he stares into the wardrobe. 
Well it used to be like that, but not anymore. Michael says, can you see anything you like? Peter is both overwhelmed and uninspired by the options before him. Michael pulls out a variety of frocks, but Peter can't make his mind up. With his cousin's growing impatience, Peter finally settles on a navy blue frock with pale blue details. Michael pulls open one of his drawers and removes a pair of tights. Here you go. He says, passing them to Peter who recoils at the sight of them. Can't I just wear socks? Peter asked. Tights look much better though. Michael replies, plus they're a bit more grown up than socks. A borrowed pair of ballet pumps are on Peter's feet as he follows his cousin to the kitchen where his mother, Aunt Jo, and young cousin James are waiting. James wears a prissy lilac frock and is clearly happy to do so. Well you two look nice. Peter's mother says, glancing from Michael's brown plaid frock to Peter's navy blue one. Her eyes drop to Peter's feet, then to his cousin's. Michael wears a pair of black low-heeled court shoes with white tights. Those shoes are nice Michael, she says, glancing back to her son's shoes and socks. Don't you think that dress would look better with tights Peter? I said that but he insisted on socks. Michael interjected. After a short discussion, Peter returns to his cousin's bedroom accompanied by his mother. She opens Michael's sock drawer and pulls out a pair of tights, before instructing Peter how to put them on. As he does so, his mother glances around her nephew's bedroom, from the impressionist print of a ballet dancer in a tutu on the wall to his dressing table bearing perfume, deodorant, moisturizer, headbands, hair clips, and several bottles of nail varnish. A few minutes later, Peter re-enters the kitchen wearing a pair of white tights in place of the socks. His mother follows, saying, I hope you don't mind Michael but he's borrowed one of your headbands too. Michael doesn't immediately reply as Auntie Jo is applying his lipstick. Once done, Michael hops off the stool and checks his reflection in a small mirror. Peter's jaw drops a little as he glances from face to face. Both James and Michael are now wearing eye makeup and lipstick. Aunt Jo smiles at Peter and asks, are you ready? Peter looks down at himself and nods shyly. Come on then, his aunt says, patting the seat of the stool. I thought you meant am I ready to go? Peter says as he reluctantly sits on the stool. His aunt tells him what to do and where to look as she applies a little eyeliner, mascara, and eyeshadow around his eyes, before putting a pale pink lipstick on his lips. Now you're ready to go, his aunt smiles. Peter's mother notices that one person is missing. Is George coming? No, he's been transferred to the cleaning department so he won't be home till late. Aunt Jo replies. Peter isn't happy with the fact that they walk to the restaurant instead of driving, and it seems to take ages. His mother, aunt and cousin James walk ahead. So when did George get transferred? Helen asks her sister-in-law. A couple of weeks ago. Jo replies. I thought he would have told me. Helen says. He is my brother after all. He's not too happy about it, the company have been restructuring over the last few months and he was given the choice of a redundancy or a transfer, she explains. And we can't really survive on just my wage so he had to take the transfer. It's less pay, but it's better than nothing. That's probably dented his pride a bit, does he work every evening? Morning and evening on a 5 till 8 split shift, 6 days a week. Joe states. I thought we'd have seen him. Helen says, knowing they arrived no later than 3.30. Well, to be honest it has dented his pride. He knew you and Peter were dropping in and decided to leave a bit early. Why on earth would he do that? Helen asked, feeling more than a little offended that her own brother had actively avoided them. He has to wear a uniform and is not quite ready for you to see him in it. Oh I see, she says, realizing the obvious. Her sister-in-law describes the plain domestic frock her husband now wears for work, along with the tabard he wears over it. It's having to wear tights and heels too that he's really struggling with. Joe adds. Hem she says trying to visualize her brother. It must be hard for him, but the world is changing. It is and for the better. Joe replies. 
Michael wasn't happy when I took his last pair of trousers, but it's only fair, if his father has to wear a frock for work then he should wear a skirt for school. Yes. I'm still toying with how to get Peter to wear one. We have a kind of deal where, if more than half the boys in class are wearing skirts then he should too. Helen explains. Just buy him one and be done with it. Joe suggests. He'll spit and shout and curse but, it's not his decision. It was only a couple of weeks ago I finally put a stop to Michael dressing like a girl. And how's he getting on? Helen asks. Well, how do you think he's getting on? Joe asks. Helen turns around to check on her son and nephew who walk a few yards behind. They do look pretty, she observes. Yes, like proper young men. Joe smiles. You're being quiet Pete his cousin Michael says as Peter hasn't spoken a word since they left the house. Peter tells him that he feels really weird being dressed like this in broad daylight. I thought you'd have got used to it since your birthday. Michael replies, assuming that Peter is now wearing a dress on a daily basis. Not outside though. Peter gulps. I have to wear a dress every Sunday and I'm not going to leave the house if I can help it. Why not? Duh, Peter retorts, because I'm wearing a dress. Michael empathizes with his cousin and reminisces over his transitional period. When it was only once in a while I used to hate wearing them, unlike James, he explains glancing down the lane toward his younger brother, his ringlets and ribbons bouncing as he intermittently skips to keep up with the adults, but then mum decided I had to wear a skirt or dress all the time. What? Just like that? No pants. Well, Michael continued, I talked her into letting me wear my school pants, which was a fair deal I guess. So how come you started wearing a school skirt? Peter asks. I thought you'd be the last person to give in. Mum just decided a couple of weeks ago. Michael shrugged. You know how they are, this idea that wearing pants is all of a sudden dressing like a girl. Tell me about it. Peter agrees. Even if mum did buy me a school skirt I'd still wear my pants whether she liked it or not, he defiantly added. That's what I thought until one day I didn't have any pants. Michael replied. Once I'd got my head around the fact that skirts and dresses are in fact boys' clothes, it's not so bad. Michael says. Call me weird but I don't really miss my pants anymore. You're weird. Peter teases. I don't think I'd ever get used to dressing like this all the time, he adds, looking down at himself. And these tights are itchy. They look nice though. Michael states. And they don't itch if you shave your legs. It's late in the evening when Peter and his mother arrive home. Peter is back in his school pants and his mother says well that was nice wasn't it? I wasn't expecting to be taken out for a meal. Peter confesses that he wasn't expecting that either. You know Michael hasn't got any boy clothes at all now. You mean pants, his mother replies as her son nods. They're hardly boys clothes these days, she reminds him for the umpteen millionth time, and you looked lovely in his dress. I might buy you one like that. Peter admits that he liked it more than any of his own dresses, but isn't quite so sure if he'd want one of his own. I couldn't believe it when I had to wear makeup too. You didn't waste any time jumping on the stool, his mother grins. And you've not exactly rushed to wash it off either. Peter blushes and gets up to wash it off, but his mother talks him into keeping it on until bedtime. The following day Peter returns home from school and hooks his bag on the back of a chair, before making himself a drink. As of today, there are now five boys in his class wearing skirts leaving eight, including himself who continue to wear pants. Some of the boys who do wear a skirt are such sissies, with their pigtails and ribbons and fluffy pink pencil cases. Others clearly wear their skirts under duress and carry a look of shame wherever they go. Of late, Peter has been getting bullied by some of the girls for not wearing a skirt, which isn't nice. He's not the only boy they bully, but since his birthday party and the dress that went with it, he's been targeted. There's nothing weirder than being told you're dressing like a girl by simply wearing pants. I've always worn pants, he'd retort, 
A couple of years ago we never wore skirts or dresses, he'd claim, just before a knee whacked his groin. It doesn't happen every day and sometimes not even every week, but in Peter's mind, it's better than wearing a skirt for school. He's not alone as other boys get the same treatment. The teachers are fully aware but being an all-female staff, apart from the cleaners, they simply feel the targeted boys are just making life hard for themselves. He hasn't told his mum because she'd just use it as an excuse. He's determined not to give in and end up wearing a stupid skirt every day for school. Wearing a dress every Sunday is bad enough. The following Monday, Andrew Carter turns up in a skirt. It looks like he's been drugged, transformed then hypnotised as he was one of the least likely to comply with modern fashions. The girls gave him a round of applause when he entered the form room that morning. The previous Friday he was a typical scruffy lad with unkempt, uncombed hair, old baseball boots, baggy pants and an oversized jumper, over a badly tied tie and an UN ironed and probably unwashed shirt. Today his hair has been washed, untangled, straightened and cut into a short, sharp bob. He wears a fitted blouse with his tie tied short and smart. A fitted jumper leads the eye down to his short pleated skirt, beneath which emerge a pair of slim smooth legs. On his feet is a pair of heeled lace-up brogues. He walks confidently, takes his reception gracefully and sits at his desk displaying a confidence hitherto unknown to him. Everything about his appearance is perfect, and he clearly knows it. Peter's a liberal. If Andrew Carter, unlikely as it may seem wants to go sissy that's fine, and at least he does it well. In the eyes of the girls he's shot from zero to hero with his new look. On the one hand Peter thinks good on him, it's a huge improvement on the distant, dishevelled demeanour he had last week, but on the other hand, it means there's now six boys in skirts and seven in pants. Peter ponders the loose deal he made with his mother and hopes it slipped her mind. For if one more boy gives in, thus tipping the balance, Peter has to wear a skirt too. Hopefully she's forgotten all about it. He hopes. Hopefully. Hoping. Tilda oh, oh, oh Tilda. A couple of weeks later, Peter and his mother are in town and passing Debenhams, his mother points out the window display. Those dresses look nice, she says. Shall we have a look inside? Do we have to? he asks. To date his mother has bought all his dresses on her own and the last thing Peter wants is to stroll up and down aisles of boys' dresses with her. Well you could do with another one and it is about time you started making your own choices she says as she pushes the door open. I know you don't always like what I like. Peter and his mother walk down numerous aisles of dresses, skirts and blouses. His mother pulls out the usual prissy sissy pink, purple and peach frocks but Peter doesn't want one of those. I've got loads of party dresses he claims. Peter you've got three. Four, he corrects. Your prairie dress isn't a party dress, she tells him, that's a summer dress. He gives up. Why do mothers come out with stupid splitting hair statements like it's not lavender it's lilac? It's not a party dress, it's a summer dress. It's a dress. They're all the same, he internally rages. But walking down aisles and aisles he realises they're anything but all the same. Short sleeves, long sleeves, bell sleeves, puffed sleeves, or no sleeves at all. Straight, A-line, pleated and circle skirts. Vest tops or spaghetti straps, even strapless frocks in all the colours of the rainbow. Soft cotton or shiny satin, soft velvet, floaty chiffon, lycra, or canvas carrying all kinds of prints. The choice is overwhelming. Occasionally he points out something he doesn't mind so much, something really plain but his mother turns her nose up at them, claiming they're the types of dresses cleaners wear. I want you to look nice, not plain, she says, scanning the racks. Oh they've got school wear here. Maybe it is time you started wearing a skirt, she said, admiring the selection of A-line, knife-pleated and box-pleated skirts in black, blue, grey, and green. I don't want to mum. Peter replies as his mother lifts a short pleated skirt from the hook. You're going to have to at some point love, surely most boys in your class are wearing skirts by now. 
Peter tells her that still less than half the boys in his class are wearing skirts, so she asks him how many. Uh. Six wear them and seven don't. Well that's near enough for me, she says as she holds the skirt against him. Come on, let's see how it looks. Oh please don't mum, please, he pleads as she heads towards the changing rooms. Oh stop being a baby Peter. I'm sure Michael didn't play up like this when he got his first school skirt. Peter concedes. His mother waits outside the changing room, looking at the nearby styles whilst he tries on the skirt. After a few minutes she asks if he's ready yet and peeps around the curtain. Peter is just fastening the zip. He's decent enough so his mother pulls the curtain wide open. That looks nice, she says, ramming her fingers down the waistband to make sure it's got some growing room. Mum can you close that? Peter snaps, trying to shut the curtain. Well there's not enough room for both of us and I want to make sure it's right, his mother replies, opening the curtain as wide as possible. She steps back and says that looks long enough don't you think? Peter looks in the mirror and says it's really short. It's a school skirt Peter, it's supposed to be short, his mother states. But, Peter looks at his reflection again and sways his hips. The pleats swoosh from one side to the other. He turns to look at the back of sways his hips again. People might see my undies, he says fearfully. Well you'll just have to make sure you don't wiggle your hips like that, his mother grins. She tells him to take it off and draws the curtain again. Peter wastes no time in removing the skirt and fiddles to clip it back onto the hanger. Just as he's done it, the curtain opens again. Muam. Let's see how this fits, she says, passing him a dress she's found. I don't like it, he says as she passes him a green frock. Don't give me that Peter you pointed it out before, his mother states. There's beige or blue if you prefer, she says, drawing his attention to the rack dead opposite the changing room. Peter looks at the one in his hand, then to the rack. Ah, uh, this'll do, he gulps. He did after all point it out earlier but it was supposedly too domestic for his mother. His mother takes the school skirt before closing the curtain. Whilst she's waiting, an assistant approaches and asks if she needs any help. She tells her that her son is trying on a dress, and that she's buying him a school skirt. They're on three for two, as are the blouses, the assistant says. Oh I didn't realize, his mother replies. I'll go and get some more when he's changed. The assistant offers to get them for her. Does he need blouses too? She asks before conforming the size. When the assistant returns, the changing room curtain is wide open once more and Peter is turning this way and that so his mother can get a good look at the dress. It's a very popular dress that, the assistant says. Most boys prefer a shirt-style frock to the back-fastening ones. His mother turns to the assistant and smiles. I must admit it looks much nicer on. Do you like it Peter? She asks. Er, uh, he groans, looking back at his reflection. On the one hand he hates it purely because it's a dress, but on the other hand it's far better than his other four dresses. He's ashamed to admit it but says it's okay I guess, he replies. At least I can fasten it myself and it's got pockets, he adds, plunging his fists into them. Well in that case we'll take it, his mother smiles. Take it off Peter then I can pay for it. He can keep it on if he likes, the assistant suggests. We try to encourage our boys to leave the store wearing their purchases, so much so much so we offer a third off. A third, his mother quizzes. Really? Yes. Please don't mum. Peter asks in utter horror. I thought you liked it, his mother asks. I don't want to wear it now though. Peter gulps, glancing vaguely towards the outside world. And definitely not out there. But it's 33% off if you do, his mother replies. At £35 it's quite expensive but at, her eyes roll upwards as she does a little mental arithmetic, pound 24 it's a good buy. Peter looks back at his reflection, fearful that he may well end up spending the rest of the afternoon in town wearing it. But. I can't wear it with my trainers, he says. It'd look silly. Well you could do with some new shoes for school anyway, 
so you don't have to wear those, his mother retorted. The assistant smiled at the petrified boy, then turned to his mother. Before you decide I'd better point out that it's a third off your entire bill, not just the cost of the dress, she says. Oh well in that case. Peter's mother says. Fold up your jeans and jumper Peter, you can keep it on. Peter cannot believe this is happening. Oh please mum no, he begs. The overly helpful assistant offers to take his three skirts and three blouses to the till whilst they have a chat. Thank you very much, his mother smiles as the assistant takes the handful of hangers. Think about it Peter, she says before listing her purchases so far and approximating the cost. And you'll need underwear, socks, tights. I'm not wearing tights mum. You say that now but come autumn you'll thank me, she replies knowingly as his heart visibly sinks to his stomach. I know it's a big step love, but it's hardly the first time you've worn a dress in public. I've not worn one in the middle of town though, on a Saturday afternoon, he groans. Well, there's a first time for everything, his mother replies. Before long they're in the footwear department. Is there anything you like, his mother asks. Uh. I dunno, he replies, scanning shelves of heeled shoes with bows and buckles and straps on. Those maybe, he says, pointing out a pair of plain lace-up shoes. They are more or less the same as the ones you've got, his mother replies. What about these? They'll go nice with your uniform and your dresses, she says picking up a pair of flat T-bar sandals, or these Mary Janes are nice, she adds, picking up a similar style but with a heel. Uh. I dunno, he replies. I don't want heels. They're only an inch or two high and Michael wears heels, his mother says before asking the assistant of the shoe department to bring him a pair of each to try. Whilst they're waiting his mother grabs a selection of white socks and opaque black tights. Peter tries on both pairs of shoes and his mother decides to buy him both pairs. Given the option of which he'd like to wear, he chooses the flats as he knows even a low heel is hard to walk in. Do you mind if he puts a pair of these on now, his mother asks the assistant, regarding a five-pack of white ankle socks. Not at all, the assistant replies with a smile. Peter's mother isn't surprised when complains about the socks. Can't I have plain ones, he moans when he realizes they have a subtle rose pattern in the knit. Before long, Peter and his mother are leaving Debenhams and for the first time in his life, Peter walks down the high street wearing a dress. He tries to keep his head down as people turn and look at him. In spite of the fact that boys wearing dresses is becoming an increasingly common sight, it's a phenomenon that continues to turn heads. Peter wishes the ground would swallow him whole when people comment on his dress. The only thing he has to be thankful of is the fact he's wearing a plainish knee-length shirt dress with a normal collar and buttons down the front and not one of the really prissy dresses his mother would have chosen. When they finally arrive home, she asks him if he'd like to try his new uniform on. Peter declines the offer, which his mother interprets as him wanting to keep his new dress on. Together they hang his new uniform in his wardrobe, and much to Peter's disappointment, she removes his old trousers and shirts. Mum, seeing as it's the end of term in a couple of weeks, can I keep my school trousers till then? No his mother replied. Oh why not? he moaned as she folds his old plain shirts and trousers into a small neat pile. Because I've just spent a fortune on your new uniform and I'm not going to wait two months before I see you wearing it. In a futile attempt to wangle a few more weeks in pants, he says, well I'll try it on now then. Well you can if you want but that won't change anything, she states. I don't know why you insist on dressing like a girl, from Monday you will be going to school dressed as a boy and that's the last I want to hear about it. Tilda oh, oh, oh Tilda. Peter's mother wakes him earlier than normal on Monday morning. She tells him to go and take a shower, and in the meantime she gets his uniform ready. Peter returned from the shower clad in the pink and white dressing gown his grandmother had given him for his birthday some three or four months previously. He looks fearfully at the uniform his mother has neatly laid out on his bed. Can't I wear my normal undies? he asks when he notices the white lace trimmed vest and matching underpants. No Peter, she replies, passing him his underpants. But, 
What if somebody sees them when I'm going up the stairs, he asks, that skirt is loads shorter than my dresses. That, my dear, is the precise reason I want you wearing nice ones, his mother smiles. Peter pulls on his lace-trimmed underpants before removing his dressing gown. Next he pulls the lace-trimmed vest over his head before stepping into the skirt. Like a typical boy he fastens it at the front before turning it around. He then pushes his arms into the short puffed sleeves of his blouse and buttons it up. Sitting on the edge of his bed, he pulls on his ankle socks with the rose pattern in the knit. Finally he slips his feet into his dainty ballet pumps and stands up. His mother looks him up and down and tells him he looks lovely. How does it feel? she asks. Peter looks down at himself. Like I've forgotten to put my trousers on, he replies. Does it have to be this short? he asks as his fingers hang several inches below the hem of his skirt. It's not that short, Peter, his mother insists. Plus it'll be nice to get some sun on those legs, it's a lovely day. Peter looks out of his bedroom window and gulps, the sun is shining, the birds are singing and a gentle breeze rocks the trees. He looks down at himself once more. Do I really look okay, he asks. You look lovely Peter, she reassures. Like a schoolboy should, she smiles. The first proper sight Peter gets of himself is in the mirror in the hallway. His pale skinny legs are almost entirely exposed, save for a few inches at the top and he quite rightly feels half naked. He spends a few moments trying and failing to get used to it before going to the kitchen. How do you like it now you've had a proper look? his mother asks as she butters some toast. I hate it, he sulks, it's far too short and everyone can see my vest through this, it's too thin, he says, pinching at his blouse. It's nice being able to see your vest, his mother replies. Almost as nice as it is seeing your legs for once. She chirps before placing a plate of toast on the table for him. Peter pulls out a chair and sits, scooping what little there is of his skirt beneath him. Once sat, the pleats cover only half of his lap and he makes another comment about how short it is. It's fine Peter, just keep your knees together and nobody will see anything, his mother advises. Once he's finished his breakfast, his mother tells him to put his tie on as he'll have to set off shortly. As usual, he ties it in front of the mirror in the hallway but can't shop glancing down at his short pleated skirt and pale legs. Let's have a look at you, his mother says as she appears. Peter turns to face her and she straightens his tie and collar, before pushing her fingers through his fringe. One last thing and then you're ready, she says before putting a simple white band in his hair to hold his fringe off his forehead. Perfect. Peter looks back at his reflection and moans, do I have to wear that too? Of course, she smiles. You want to look nice don't you? Not that nice, he moans, noticing a small white bow on one side of his headband. Well I do, his mother states, passing him his school bag. She kisses him on his forehead and tells him to have a nice day, before opening the front door for him. As Peter steps outside his a bag of nerves. He nervously looks around before swinging his bag onto his shoulder and step by terrifying step, he walks to school. Goose bumps form on his legs as the gentle breeze caresses them. If he didn't feel so humiliated it would feel quite nice. As he nears his school, he hears jeers and taunts from some of the boys along with coos and wolf whistles from the girls. He's practically petrified as he enters his form room, greeted by an uproar of taunts, applause and jeers. Well done Peter, his teacher says. It's good to see you've finally joined the modern world. Peter forces a smile as he pulls out his chair, holds his skirt beneath him and carefully sits down. Some of the boys loudly whisper sissy girly boy and other insults. The teacher silences them and after a brief pause she points out that the boys who still insist on wearing trousers are now in a minority. Some of Peter's friends distanced themselves from him, but that was only an extension of a void that started after his birthday party back in the spring. The two who did attend his party were okay with him, although neither of them had to wear a skirt for school, yet. One thing Peter did notice is the girls who bullied him now smiled at him even complimented him. Peter's sense of shame didn't ebb as the day progressed, but he had expected to receive more taunts and teasing than he ended up getting. 
His skirt was lifted twice by a couple of girls, which he could have done without, especially since they made no secret of his pretty underwear. When he arrived home his mother asked him how school was. Okay I guess, he replied, before asking if he could change. After you've finished your homework, his mother replied. Oh but I've got loads, he moaned. Well the sooner you start the sooner you'll finish. When Peter finally finishes his homework, he goes to his bedroom to change out of his uniform. Within minute he's back downstairs, still in his uniform. I can't find any pants. Put a dress on then, his mother replies. But I don't want to wear a dress. I want to wear pants. You don't have any pants Peter, so it's either a dress or you can keep your uniform on, she replies. Oh but, he moans, almost in tears. But nothing Peter, it's high time you stop dressing like a girl all the time, so from now on it's boy clothes only. But I don't feel like a boy unless I'm wearing pants. And you don't look like a boy when you do, his mother retorts. The next morning is dull and drizzly. Peter's mother suggests he should wear knee socks today, but seeing the pretty diamond pattern up the sides, he's naturally reluctant. Nevertheless mother knows best and Peter does as he's told. After all it's only a pair of socks and not the end of the world. On Wednesday however, it almost is the end of the world when he unravels his towel before his swimming class, only to find an all-in-one swimsuit with a little built-in skirt. Some of the other boys wear the same style and some wear a standard all-in-one costume, whilst the few remaining old-fashioned boys still wear trunks, and proudly so. The girls wear two-piece tankini-style costumes, and think the boys who insist on bearing their chests are Neanderthals, throwbacks from a bygone age. As Peter steps out to the poolside in his tiny swimming dress, he hopes a shark will jump out and take him. Instead and predictably the old boys jeer whilst the girls wolf whistle, point and stare. You'd have nice pins if you shaved them, one girl shouts. That evening when Peter arrived home he says, why didn't you tell me you'd bought me a swimming costume? I thought you'd have known, she replies. Was you expecting trunks? Well, yes. I was, he replied as he cast his mind back to the shame he felt. His mother asked him if any of the other modern boys still wore trunks, knowing full well that none of them would. So don't be surprised on Friday when you find a PE skirt and gym knickers in your bag, she added, glancing down at his legs and commenting on his nice tan. He grabs his skirt and looks down. Do you think I should shave them, he asks. Yes, his mother replies. He drops his skirt and looks at her expectantly, as if to ask, well, how do I do that then? His mother reads his expression like a book. Well don't ask me. I've never shaved, why would I? Women and girls began to turn their back on skirts and dresses many many years ago. One inevitable side effect meant they ceased to remove their body hair. In fact doing so was considered another symbol of subservience, along with wearing perfume, makeup and earrings. Peter's mother is a typical woman of the age. She's never worn a skirt or a dress in her adult life, she's never worn makeup or perfume, she's never shaved her legs or armpits and has never worn high-heeled shoes. In fact the only things the modern woman has in common with those of days gone by is the blob, boobs, bras, birth and babies. And the babies are handed over to the husband as soon as the nursing period is over. I know Michael shaves his legs. And I guess he'll either use a razor, a cream or wax them. Peter's mother says. Why don't you ask him next time we visit, she suggests. Some of the guys in Peter's class obviously shave. The boys in skirts with hairy legs just look silly. Peter is lucky to be relatively fair so his leg hairs don't stand out that much. If anything they look more out of focus than hairy. He ponders asking one of the boys in his class for advice, but shies away from the idea. Joanne King however, being pretty much the only girl in the entire school who still wears a skirt also clearly shaves her legs, so on Friday, Peter sheepishly approaches her. Hi Joanne, he says. Hi Pete, she replies looking him up and down. I'm glad you decided to wear skirt, she says. It's got to be easier than getting need in the balls every week. Uh, yeah I suppose.
Peter replies. After a brief uncomfortable silence, Peter asks, do you think I should shave my legs? Sure, she replies without hesitation. Figured as much, he frowns. How do you do yours? With a razor, she bluntly replies, implying it's both obvious and none of his business. Sorry. Peter hangs his head. I just don't know how and don't know who to ask, apart from you. Joanne tells him that it's easy. So explains the soap, the lather, and the few minutes to let it soften the hairs. Then you just pull a razor over it and rinse it, over and over till there's no hair left. She tells him. And then do the same thing to your chin, she adds with a sheepish smile. You better not be chatting him up sissy girl, a voice suddenly shouted. Peter looked around to see a group of four girls quickly approaching. He turns back to Joanne who disappears around a corner. He looks back and the four girls are all around him. What? he asks. Curtsy before you address me boy, the ringleader ordered. What? Peter said in a trembling voice. You know, she said, bearing down on him threateningly. Now curtsy. Peter gulped, grabbed his skirt and curtsied. The girls tittered. That's better, the ringleader said as she stepped back. Stay away from that sissy girl pretty boy, she ordered, grabbing Peter's cheek and pulling him towards her. You're too good for the likes of her, she said before letting him go and marching off with her posse. The following week Peter encounters Joanne being bullied by the other girls. The four of them surround her, call her names like Sissa Girl and tell her she's even lower than the boys, trying to look pretty for the boys. You're the lowest of the low and an insult to the rest of us. The ringleader barks as she holds Joanne by her blouse. She then grabs and lifts Joanne's skirt, asking her why she dresses like a boy. I bet you're even wearing frillis you cowering servile tart. Peter steps in shouting leave her alone, as he pushes the ringleader off Joanne. As quick as anything he gets kneed in the balls and finds himself cowering on the floor. Through teary eyes he looks up at the girl who'd just put him down. I thought now you're wearing a skirt you'd know your place, she says as he squirms at her feet. She looks at Joanne who stares sympathetically down on Peter, well your boyfriend didn't save you this time damsel. She looks back at Peter, still squirming and orders her minions to pick him up. Peter is dragged to his feet and held fast. Now unless you want, again she knees Peter as hard as she can in the balls, this to happen to your boyfriend every day, she watches Peter crumple to the floor in agony, you'll stop dressing like a boy. Do you understand? she shouts, right in Joanne's trembling face. Joanne nods, trying her best not to cry. The ringleader turns her attention back to Peter, still breathless and clutching his groin. She warns him to stay away from Joanne, unless you want another kiss on your nuts, pretty boy. The group of aggressors leave them alone and Joanne crouches down over Peter's writhing body. I'm sorry. She says with tears in her eyes, you should have stayed away. I'll do what they say, she says as she tries to help him up. Peter tells her not to give in to them, that she should wear what she likes and that it's got nothing to do with them. Joanne agrees as she finally helps Peter to his feet. He wipes his eyes and straightens his skirt. Joanne asks him if he's okay and bravely he nods whilst clearly he's not. The end of break bell sounds and they both look randomly into space. Peter reminds her not to give in to them before they part company and head to their respective classes, Joanne walks in one direction, Peter hobbles in the other. The following day, Peter is disheartened to see that Joanne attends school wearing trousers, a plain shirt and flat lace-up shoes for the first time. At least those girls seem to be leaving her alone now, he thinks as they share a distant smile.
my sister and I. My family had left and I was sitting at home thinking why is it that chicks get these beautiful clothes to wear and I have to wear these plain old cotton t-shirts and stuff so I decided to go upstairs and try on some of my sister's things. I went up and pulled up a pair of her panties then a pair of pants which was a very unusual feeling having something on me that tight and then one of her shirts. Then I heard the garage opening and realized everyone was home so I took everything off as fast as I could but couldn't quite get the panties off and my clothes back on so I kept her panties on until I could take them off the only problem with that was I never got the chance and ended up having to wear them all day. That night I had forgotten I was wearing them so when I went to get ready for bed I saw them and freaked out because I realized I couldn't put them back but I didn't want to get caught with them so I stuck them in a drawer under some of my boxes and figured I'd put them back ASAP after I washed them. Little did I know that my mom was doing all of our laundries that weekend. So when I went to wash them and they were gone I got a bit scared but my mom never said anything about it so I didn't worry. Then my sister started doing ballet and I was so jealous but I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want to be thought weird for wanting to do a girl's thing. So instead I went behind my family's back and would wear my sister's panties leotard tights and tutu at every possible opportunity. Then the inevitable happened I got caught. My family was out and I was dressed in the tutu and all and they were on their way home to get my sister's ballet things. Well, they got home and they were all missing and I'm in my room in a tutu and tights and then came clean telling my mom that I wanted to dress as a girl and do ballet. So she told me that it wasn't too late to register for beginner ballet so we grabbed my sister's spare clothes and left I was registered for beginner's ballet, in the same class as my twin sister but it was pretty embarrassing being seen in front of all of these little girls in their tutus and such and then walking in as a boy in all pink. Well, unannounced to me my parents decided to also let me dress as a girl as long as I wanted, as a matter of fact I didn't really have a choice. My mom sent my dad home while I learned new stretches and such he went home and removed all of my boy clothes and replaced them with one set of my sister's. When I got home I went to change and realized none of my clothes were there anymore so I asked my mom and she told me that she and my father had decided to allow me to live my dreams and dress as a girl as long as I wanted and that they were going to take me shopping the next day. So I just went to bed, I had had a long day, and when I got up I showered and put on what they had put in my bedroom and my mom and sister did my makeup but I was still very boyish looking so my mom had an old wig that she put on me. I looked in the full length mirror and wow did I actually look like a girl. So we went to the mall and just started buying we already knew my size because I was the same size as my sister. So my mom would just hold the clothes up to me to see if they would look good and then just take it. We got me my own tights and leotard and tutu for ballet and also went down to the school district and transferred my sister and me to a different school where no one knew me so I could go in my disguise as a girl w out being disturbed. I was taught how to sit and act just like a girl and essentially became one. I hung out with all the girls and when we started dating I even dated boys. We would go to the mall and hang out and my sister and I looked so much alike that we told everyone we were identical twins and we both hung out with the same group, we even dated brothers together. In high school, we joined the cheerleading team and my sister became captain. We both still do ballet and I would never even dream of going back to wearing boys clothes. Sissy Little Billy. In my formative years, my mother took me to a ballet class and I really enjoyed it. I stuck with it for years but as I got older, I began getting teased by the kids on the street and at school. By the age of 11 I decided to give it up, in spite of the fact I'd just reached grade 4 and was really proud of myself. I gave it up for several reasons, it's not cool, I'd found new hobbies and beyond great for it gets really hard and really intense. I don't go to ballet anymore but I still get teased for it occasionally and still get called Billy by a handful of kids. This often leads to the tiresome why did he call you Billy conversation. 
Even some of the girls think it's a bit weird when they learn that I used to do ballet, and all have to ask if I wore a tutu. No. I groan. Boys wear shorts and a t-shirt, like Billy Elliot did. My mother understood my reasons for wanting to quit, but told me that I shouldn't worry about what other people say. It wasn't just because I was being teased that I decided to quit my twice-weekly ballet classes. It was taking up too much of my time and I felt like I was just growing out of it. Plus, taking it beyond grade 4 is something only prospective professionals tend to do, and my waning interest no longer justified the time, effort or expense of continuing. I'd also found new interests that I enjoyed more, such as playing cricket, making model kids, going karting and playing video games. One afternoon at school, Miss York, my English teacher asked if I'd stay behind after class. Initially I thought that I must be in trouble for something, so waited nervously whilst the other kids filtered out. Miss York is also the school's head of drama. She tells me that she's looking for cast members for the big play that's performed at the end of the academic year, and asks if I do ballet. No. I reply. Not anymore. I added, informing her that I gave it up a year and a half ago. But you'll still know some steps, she asked. I'm not looking for Wayne's sleep, she said. I tell her that I'm not much of an actor and don't have much interest in drama. And my ballet's really rusty. I add. Well, it needn't be a speaking part, she tells me. You'd only be on stage for a couple of minutes, during a dream sequence, it just requires someone who can do some basic ballet moves, and you're the only one I've found so far. Surely there's girls who do ballet. Yes but I'm specifically looking for a boy, she tells me before explaining further. The play is called Dreams and Aspirations and explores how we imagine being racing drivers, astronauts, athletes, doctors, dancers, teachers, builders, engineers, etc. And features a series of dream sequences. My part is dancing the dream sequence of a boy who wants to become a ballet dancer, your sequence will be an homage to Billy Elliot, she tells me. Have you seen it? Yes. I groan. I'm less than impressed. Half the kids already call me Billy the ballerina because I used to do ballet. I told her. I've been trying to shake that nickname off since junior school. I moaned. It'll give you the chance to demonstrate how skillful and physical ballet is, if anything it's to challenge the stereotype that dance is just for girls, just like Billy Elliot did. She's very persuasive and since there's no one else in the school to play the part, I reluctantly accept. We rehearse for weeks and liaise with the woodwork and art teachers when designing the set. The stage will become a classroom set with chairs and desks set out in rows. The play is set during a really boring class and each student drifts off has a dream sequence. These are depicted on a raised platform above and behind the classroom set and will be performed by a dream double. They've built some really impressive sets depicting an operating theatre, a space station, a racing car, a building site, etc. Which can be quickly erected and removed in between each dream sequence. There's also a back projection to give the sequences a more cinematic feel, although my sequence doesn't involve any props other than a bar and a big mirror. It's been over 18 months since I quit ballet so I feel more than a little rusty, but the rest of the cast are really impressed with my dancing. None of them could do it and all of a sudden, I feel proud to be part in this year's school play, not to mention proud of myself. Then, two weeks before the performance, John Sully, the boys whose dream I'm performing has to have his appendix removed and will be off school for about three weeks. At this stage in the rehearsals it's disastrous to lose a key player and Miss York is struggling to find a replacement for him. The last thing the drama teacher wants is to drop my scene, and I don't want that either, especially after all the work I've put in. I'd resurrected my daily stretching routine which involves 30 minutes in the mornings and evenings as well as practicing my steps at home too. After a few days of not knowing if I'm going to be part of the play, Miss York gives me some great news. She's found a replacement for John but since his last-minute replacement is a girl called Kelly, some minimal changes need to be made to the script. Instead of the scene being about a boy dreaming of becoming a ballet dancer, it's a girl dreaming of becoming a ballerina. 
but I can't dance like a ballerina, it's completely different, it'd mean changing the choreography and everything. I state. Not really, the drama teacher claimed. Just a change of costume is all that's needed, she says. I'm disappointed too. I really wanted to have an homage to Billy Elliot in this play. Well, surely Kelly could play a boy. I suggested. That makes more sense. She'd need a haircut, the drama teacher said. And I doubt she'd be willing to do that just for one small part in the play, she claimed. She could wear a wig. Possibly, but she is very pretty, even with a wig I don't think she'd be very convincing. Miss York replied. I know it's a big ask, but you've put so much into this already, it'd be unthinkable to find a girl who does ballet to replace you, she said. Two minutes in a tutu. That's all it is, she assured. Reluctantly, I agreed to go along with the changes. I did change the choreography a little to make it a more convincing routine for a ballerina. I dug out my old DVDs of the Bolshoi Ballet during Swan Lake and the National Ballet's Nutcracker and focused on the ballerinas. I wasn't too happy about changing my choreography at this late stage but, if I'm going to do it, I want to do it properly. It was only as we prepared for the full dress rehearsal that I began to wish that I'd never agreed to the changes in my script. As a ballet dancer, I was only going to wear shorts and a t-shirt but now I'm playing a ballerina I have to wear a pink leotard with a big pink pancake tutu which means everyone can see my bum regardless of whether I bend or not. In addition I'm wearing pink tights, pink shoes, full makeup, false eyelashes, and a tiara. Even Miss York couldn't help but snigger when she first saw me in costume. Everyone did. My boyish hair is scraped into the tiniest ponytail, held with a bobble, hairpins and hairspray before a fake bun was pinned in place. A pair of magnetic diamond earrings completed my costume. Are you nervous? Miss York asked as I shyly loitered backstage. I gulped and nodded. Well don't be, you look amazing and I'm sure your routine will be spellbinding, she claimed. It'll be anything but. I might have reached grade for so for a 12-year-old, I'm not a bad dancer, but that was ages ago and in spite of returning to my morning stretching routines and practicing my arabesques and pirouettes, my chas, sort and jeet on a daily basis. I really don't think I'll be convincing as a ballerina. Boys are taught differently to girls and I rack my brains trying to recall how our dance tutors used to coach the girls. It's subtle differences like the angle of our wrists and ankles, the way we're supposed to hold our heads. Girls deliver their steps with a level of grace that the boys can't achieve, so the boys tend to be more assertive in their approach. I never learned to flutter my fingers and wasn't confident on point, a technique that I'd only just begun a few months before I quit. Whilst I've had a couple of months to bush up on my ballet, I've only had two weeks to learn to dance like a girl. There's nothing to do but limber up and linger whilst the other cast members are getting ready. At least all the other boys are wearing stage makeup too so I'm not the only one feeling shy and sheepish. But unlike mine, theirs isn't so distinctly feminine. Some rehearse their lines, others chat in groups. The backstage crew scurry around and I find a quiet corner to do my final stretches and last-minute practice. The stage manager, one of the fifth-year students, eventually tells everyone to be silent backstage. Dream doubles in the wings please, he says. I and the others make our way to the wings, our nerves increase with every step. Teresa who's playing a school teacher is the first on stage. The rest of us wait in silence. Susan is dressed as an astronaut, Mark is a racing driver, Mary is a surgeon, Robert, predictably is a builder, Brian is a civil engineer and Rose is a computer programmer, and me, being a ballerina am the one they're all staring at. The girls tell me I look cute and boys sneer and call me a faggot. It's not my fault John dropped out and Kelly stepped in. I stated beneath my breath as the play acted out on stage. I should have been like Billy Elliot, not Nicola Morova. Who? Robert asked as a teacher told us to shush. She's a famous ballerina. I said in hushed tones. So are you. Mark sneered. I gulped and glanced at the girls. Rose rolled her eyes and cast me a supportive smile. 
Mary mouthed ignore him whilst Susan faff fed with one of several hoses that hung from her costume. I look out to the stage and its schoolroom set. It's in darkness apart from a spotlight on Emily who's dreaming of becoming a teacher. On the platform above, her dream is being acted out by Teresa. Heard but unseen from my vantage point in the wings. Eventually Teresa exits the platform and the stage is fully illuminated once more. She rejoins us and despite that fact we could only hear her performance, we silently congratulated her on a great performance. The classroom skits in between our dream performances are quite funny. They tease both teachers and pupils, poke fun at the national curriculum. The spotlight soon focuses on James and Mark's performance as a racing driver begins. The sound of Fleetwood Max the chain booms through the PA speakers along with samples of Formula One cars, speeding and skidding around the back-projected racing track. Butterflies burst into my belly because it's my turn next. I focus on my routine, visualize the choreography, make sure I'm warmed up by putting my palms flat on the floor, making sure the other members of the cast don't see my backside, before propping my ankle on the waist-high rail and reaching out over my leg. I repeat on the other leg, knowing full well that they're all staring at me. It is humiliating but I'm not going to dance without being properly warmed up. That's really impressive. Teresa exclaimed under her breath. How do you do it? she asked. Lots of practice. I replied as I put myself on point for a brief moment. Mark's sequence ended and he returned to the wings holding a huge papier-make trophy and wearing a big paper laurel wreath over one shoulder. We congratulated him as we'd done with Teresa and after another quick stretch, I took a deep breath before making my way to the stage. I felt a couple of encouraging pats on my shoulders before I made my way up to the platform on which I'd perform my dance. This would have been nerve-wracking enough if I was dressed like Billy Elliot. I'm practically crapping myself as I climb the steps in the darkness and take my place on the stage where I adopt the first position. I wait nervously for the spotlight to shine on me and my music to begin. I remain completely still and foresee my routine whilst my nerves almost shake me off my feet. All of a sudden, my eyes are filled with light and my ears are filled with the opening notes of Thakorkovsky's Nutcracker Suite. I breathed into my diaphragm and began. The two-minute routine incorporates music from The Nutcracker, Swan Lake, Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella. It's not long but when you're dancing, knowing that everyone is watching and you need to do your best, two minutes is a lifetime. All the time I'm prancing and dancing, spinning and leaping, I'm telling myself one thing. Don't mess up the point work, it's only a short sequence on tiptoe but people underestimate how hard it is having your entire body weight on the very tips of your toes. The adrenaline builds. I feel the fire inside glowing brighter and hotter as the dance takes over. It's cheesy I know but Billy Elliot was right, it feels like electric. My routine ends right on cue to a lackluster applause. I expected more to be honest. I perform a huge dramatic curtsy before rising and gracefully stepping forward. On the stage below, Kelly should be picking up a bouquet of flowers which she'll hand to me. I reach down and take it, hold it like a ballerina should, curtsy once more and the spotlight dims. Finally, with my heart and lungs pounding, I exit the stage. My fellow cast members tell me I was brilliant, well, the girls do, but I know they couldn't see anything. I thank them all the same. I'm glad it's over and glad that I didn't fall, twist my ankle or mess up the point work. Although in a way I wish had twisted my ankle. This is only the dress rehearsal, tomorrow I'll be doing it in front of the whole school and their families. I want nothing more but to go and change out of my costume, but I stay in the wings with my fellow cast members until the end of the play. I may be the only ballerina but I'm not the only one who's nervous about their performance. Once the rehearsal was over, the drama teacher pulled us up on a few minor details but on the whole, said we'd done an excellent job. Later, she took me to one side and said I was amazing. Nobody would guess that you're really a boy, she said. They don't have to, everyone knows I am. And after tomorrow, everyone will know what a wonderful dancer you are. Yeah maybe. I said. Most likely they'll be focusing on the boy dressed as a girl thing.
They won't even notice the routine that I've strived so hard to carry off. I got home and mum asked how the dress rehearsal went. Okay I guess. She questioned why I sounded so glum. There's something I've been meaning to tell you, about the play. I said. I guess I'd hoped it'd be cancelled or maybe I would twist my ankle today, but the show still goes on and it's time I told my mum that John dropped out now Kelly's playing his part. Well, not his part. Her part. I gulped. Which means I'm not playing Billy Elliot but a ballerina. I confessed. That explains your makeup. Mum said. I felt myself blush. I had washed it off but traces of foundation, eyeshadow, blusher and lipstick remained, she informed me. I wore false eyelashes too. I glumly said. And a tiara. A tutu too I hope. Mum grinned, before asking when John dropped out and why I didn't tell her. I told her and she assured me that she wouldn't have been mad, before prompting me to describe my costume in detail. I glumly described the pancake tutu and the hundreds of plastic gemstones that decorate it and my bodice, the little puffed sleeves, my false eyelashes, my tiara, my magnetic diamond earrings and the layers of makeup that were so thick I could feel its weight on my face. And dance tights and point shoes. Mum's enlightened grin had become permanent. What colour? she asked. Pink. I meekly replied. Just your shoes or? The whole costume is pink, baby pink. I said as mum gasped. It was almost as if she'd stopped breathing for a few seconds. Oh I can't wait to see it. I bet you looked beautiful. Did you? I dunno, probably not. The girls said I looked cute and the boys said I looked like a fag. I informed her. Well what do boys know? Mum scowled. I'm sure you look delightful. I can't wait for tomorrow. I hope cameras are allowed. I hope they're not. I said. It's gonna be bad enough wearing a pink tutu in front of the whole school and their parents, the last thing I want is a photograph of it. Oh it's just stage fright and last minute nerves. I'm sure you'll be perfect, she assured. The next day is the most nerve-wracking day of my life. With the school year coming to a close and only the end of term to look forward to, I and the other members of the cast and crew spend much of the afternoon preparing for tonight's one and only performance of this year's school play, Dreams and Aspirations. We fill the school hall with chairs, over 600 of them. Cast members rehearse their lines, the school band rehearse the music, the prop builders frantically finish the finer details if the various sets. It's busy, almost frantic. I have little time to worry because there's so much to be done. The school bell rings at 3.15pm but we're not going anywhere. After a buffet supper, it's time for all 18 cast members to get into costume. The gods must be looking down on me and laughing because I'm one of the first to called. Already. I whine as I make my way backstage. It's only just gone 4 o'clock pm and they play starts at 7.30 pm. By 4.30 I'm ready. The drama teacher reminds me not to touch my face and definitely don't rub my eyes. I have an embarrassing three hours to look forward to, knocking about in my baby pink leotard and tutu. The girls coo and snigger. The boys just snigger, especially when I'm limbering up and practicing my pirouettes. Oi Billy, you're showing your ass. Brian taunts. In a pancake tutu, I can't do anything about that. I can't even hang my arms casually by my sides thanks to its broad horizontal disc. They're either folded or I'm stood with my wrists gently brushing the perimeter of my tutu. At some point over the next two hours, seemingly every one of the kids involved with the play ask me why I'm stood like I am. The drama teacher gathers us all together for a pep talk. Those of us performing the dream sequences must remain deadly silent whilst we're waiting in the wings. Can we get changed once our skit is over? I asked, hoping that I'd be able to get out of this ridiculous costume once and for all. No the drama teacher bluntly replied. You all need to be in costume and in character for the curtain call, she told us. Boys, you need to make a big, dramatic bow, and girls, 
a nice curtsy, she said before looking directly at me. Now Peter, since you're playing a girl, you have to curtsy at the end too. Okay. Really miss? I groan as some of the others snigger. Ballerinas don't bow, she smiled. Now, after the final curtain call. I want you all to meet and greet and mingle with the audience. After we've got changed. I asked. No, in costume, she replied. I sighed. I only signed up to wearing it for a couple of minutes on stage. If I'd realized I'd be wearing it for half the afternoon and most of the evening, I'd have had even more second thoughts. The fact that everyone else will be in costume is no consolation. I'd happily wear Susan's space suit or Mark's racing driver outfit. Even Teresa's blouse, pencil skirt and stiletto heels would be preferable to my costume. At around 7 o'clock p.m., the audience begin filtering in and filling the chairs. All of us involved are getting nervous and not a single one of us wants to mess up our scene. A cacophonous chatter echoes from the hall, hundreds of voices all talking at once. Our nerves increase as we rehearse our lines and routines one last time. I stretch and limber my muscles and tendons, practice my arabesques, plies, pirouettes and jettas. The lights dim. The audience falls silent. The old Grange Hill theme blasts through the PA and play finally begins. The audience laugh at the classroom skit. We tell Teresa, the first to perform a dream sequence, to break a leg as she makes her way to the platform above the stage. The audience coos as the lights dim and her scene begins. We'd all had chance to watch each other's scenes during rehearsals and the combination of lighting, music and back projections is really quite impressive for a high school play anyway. Mark's noisy racing driver scene means I've only got a few more minutes in which to quell the horde of butterflies in my tummy and prepare myself. Does my makeup still look okay? I quietly ask Teresa and Rose. They assure me it does just as Mark returns with his trophy and laurel wreath. We congratulate him and it's my turn next. Break a leg, they say as I prepare to take my position. I was hoping I'd do that last night. I said in a shaky voice before making my way through the darkness, up the steps and onto the dark platform. As I begin to dance, the last thing on my mind is my pink tutu and feminine makeup. I have to concentrate on getting my steps perfect, on being completely balanced, on moving with the music, anticipating the segues between the Nutcracker Suite and Swan Lake, Cinderella and finally Sleeping Beauty. I flows through my ears and out of my limbs, conducting every moment of my well-rehearsed routine. Arabesque to the left, a petit jeet to the right, a pirouette on demo point brings back to centre stage. I chass this way and chass back. My weightless tutu bounces around me, but not so much that it would ever cover my backside. Another arabesque and a pirouette back to centre stage where I perform the hardest part of my routine, the point work. I raise my arms to the fifth position as I rise into the very tips of my toes. Step, step, pass, pass, step, step arabesque, down, sisone, sisone, back to point, step, pass, step, pass, pirouette and finally stop in the fourth position. The music stops right on cue and a huge applause erupts from the audience. Thankfully I'm facing them. I hold my position and take a deep breath. I curtsy then step forward and reach down for my bouquet. In the stage bellow, Kelly climbs into a desk and passes it up to me. Aaf the audience coos in unison before clapping once more. I return to fourth, curtsy again and my spotlight fades. I breath a huge sigh of relief as I descend the steps and return to the wings. There's still another 40 minutes of the hour-long play. We loiter silently waiting for the curtain call. I've been dressed like this for almost four hours now and all I want is to be able to hold my arms normally. If my tutu wasn't part of my leotard I'd take it off. I perch myself on a box, making sure there's space behind for my tutu. Teresa joins me and pulls off her heels. These are killing me, she whispers as she rubs her feet. Are they hard to walk in? I ask. Yeah, but not as hard as those, she replied glancing at my point shoes. 
Sorry, she whispers as a stagehand tell us to shush. Turning back to me, in an almost silent whisper she says, I crept halfway up the steps when you were dancing, it was amazing. I gulped and felt myself blush. Thanks. I said as we were hushed again. She pushed her toes back into her shoes, took hold of my hand, squeezed it gently and smiled a reassuring smile. She let go and we sat in silence whilst the play progressed. It's a long wait for the end and David Bowie's space oddity marks the final dream sequence. I wish I was in the audience for this bit. I whispered to Teresa. We'd seen it in rehearsals and the ISS model and ISS set looked great with the starscape back projection. It'll look ten times better with the lights down. Yeah but you'd need three seats. Teresa grinned, stroking my tutu. I can't imagine what it's like wearing one of these. Neither could I until yesterday. I quietly replied. Didn't you wear one when you did go to ballet? She asked. Boys don't wear tutus. I informed her. Well, not normally. I said. The music from the stage began to fade so we ceased talking. Susan's performance ended and after one final classroom scene, the curtain came down to a riotous applause. The kid who played the school teacher took the first curtain call, followed by the kids who'd played the pupils. Then one by one, those of us playing their dream doubles take the stage one final time, Teresa first. Then Mark with his trophy and laurel leaf. Then me with my bouquet of flowers. I performed a big dramatic curtsy and am given a second bouquet. I wasn't expecting that. I take my place with the others and stand smiling as Mary, Brian, Rose, Robert and finally Susan take their curtain call. Susan gets by far the biggest applause because her space station scene is by far the most impressive. I'm a bit annoyed when she takes a bow, but I guess performing a curtsy in her spacesuit would be quite difficult. The stage crew take to the stage and get another round of applause, followed by Miss York, writer, director, drama teacher. The curtains closes. The applause continues. The curtains open once more and we bow and curtsy on last time. I glad it's all finally over. But I know it's not. There's a buffet in the gymnasium where there's also a display of production sketches and photographs. Myself and the others are ushered through and are greeted by classmates, teachers and family members. Mum wastes no time in finding me and telling me how wonderful I was, and much to my surprise my old ballet teacher Miss Corelli is present. Your routine was delightful Peter, she gushes. I almost burst into tears when you went on point, it was simply spellbinding. I'm sure she's over-exaggerating but I smiled and thanked her. She doubly impressed to learn that it was mostly my own choreography and that I'd learned the short point routine without a tutor. My feelings are mixed between pride and complete embarrassment. Whilst plenty of people approach and congratulate me, most of the attention in this meet and greet was on Susan's space suit. Some of those who talk to me are a little taken aback to discover that I'm not a girl. I must have reiterated the tale that I was supposed to be a male dancer a dozen times. I think it's lovely that he played a ballerina instead of a ballet dancer, my mother gushed to a small group of parents and pupils. I only found out myself last night. It was a last-minute compromise, it was either that or drop the scene altogether. Miss York told them. She explained that in she wanted to challenge the stereotype that ballet is for girls, a bit like Billy Elliot. Having a girl dreaming of becoming a dancer felt like a cliché but, that's what we ended up with, she smiled and looked me up and down. Having a boy play the ballerina does challenge some stereotypes. Mum replied. They both cast their eyes over me. Yes I suppose it does. Miss York smiled. I hadn't thought of that. Everyone seemed to just stare at me for a few seconds. I've had this costume on for about five hours and there's no getting used to how exposed it makes me feel. Are you cold? Miss York asks. No I uh, just don't know where to put my arms. I replied. I can only stand like a capital A for so long. I told them as I demonstrated the only alternative to folding my arms and huddling myself. They chuckle. 
I suggest putting a couple of holes in the tutu to put my arms through. They chuckle some more before the small cluster falls silent. I glanced around and Teresa caught my eye. She beckoned me over so I sheepishly sauntered over. She was chatting with Rose and her parents but left them to meet me halfway. I can't get used to you being that tall. I said. Her heels must be at least three inches high, putting her a good two inches above me. How tall are you when you do that tippy-toe thing, she asked. I dunno. I said. I can't wait to get out of this. I bet you can't, she smiled. You've been flashing your bum to like, everyone, she grinned. I grimaced and glanced around. I know. I can't help it. I replied. And on Monday at school, everyone's going to be like. I saw your bum on Saturday. I whined. Thankfully there's only one week of term left and they'll have forgotten about it after the summer. I optimistically added. Until they start editing the footage for the DVD, she said. I'm quite excited about it, she added, before explaining further. Apparently they'd kept the covert cameras secret so we didn't get doubly nervous but it turns out that they'd put a number of action cams hidden on and around the stage in order to produce a DVD of the show. You're kidding. I gasped after learning that next term's media studies class will be using the footage to learn video editing techniques. I nervously glanced around as I imagined the footage of me not only being part of the curriculum, but probably leaked and put on YouTube too so my cousins earn. I don't even want to think about it. Mum and Miss Corelli mingled with other parents and teachers. Every time I scan the room to locate them, they seem to be smiling and gesturing in my direction. I imagine my mother is going overboard with how proud she is and how beautiful my performance was. Miss Corelli will be telling them that she's my ballet teacher and blah blah blah. Some of my classmates sheepishly sauntered over and took the mickey out of my costume, before sort of complimenting my dancing. Some of the girls said I look better as a girl and said I looked cute. I grimaced. Well I'd have preferred it if John hadn't dropped out. I said. Aren't you glad I stepped in? Kelly grinned as she leant on my shoulder. I am. Well I did try to talk Miss York into making you play a boy. I told her as I eased myself from under her elbow. I know, she said, playing with her long flowing hair. But I don't think I'd have been very convincing as a boy. Neither was Peter, one of my friends interjected before mimicking my current stance, a relaxed second position. I folded my arms and told him that there's not many places to put my arms whilst I'm wearing a pancake tutu. He suggested I changed and I told him that we're not allowed. Not yet anyway. I said before glancing around. Susan still has her space suit on and it's still gathering plenty of attention. She's often battling with the tubes and does look quite hot inside it. I turned to Teresa who's also looking hot, but in a different way. She smiles and says it's a wonder she hasn't fainted in that. I was just thinking the same thing. I chuckled. I might tell Miss York that we have to get changed on health and safety grounds. Oh, but you look ace, she said. So do you. I replied. My eyes dropped to her shiny black stiletto heels and moved up to her nylon-clad ankle. Her black tights are much thinner than mine. They're the sort a grown-up would wear. Her knee-length pencil skirt hugs her hips and ten she erupts into a billowing white blouse. Her skin is like porcelain and her lips evoke a deep red rose. She doesn't normally wear glasses but perched on her nose is a pair of shapely flat lens spectacles. She really suits them. Her big bright eyes flicker from left to right. She tells me that I'm staring. Sorry, you just look, really, tall. I sheepishly mutter. She smiles and looks me up and down. Do that tiptoe thing. I wanna see how tall you can be. Er, uh, it's not that easy. I claim, nervously glancing around. Oh go on. I'll hold you, she says, reaching out to take my hands. They are warm and welcoming. She clutches and I clutch back before quickly putting myself on point. I hold the position for a moment and enjoy being a couple of inches taller than her.
before dropping myself down to my natural height. She tells me it's an amazing talent. I tell her it hurts. It's still amazing, she said. Anyone could have played my part, or anyone else's, but no one else in the school could have played yours. I gulped as a bucket full of pride dropped into my belly. I reckon there's girls who could have done better. I might be the only boy who does, did ballet, but. I think a girl would have been more suited to the role that me. You can say that again. Robert said, almost sneering at me. But no, he added, just before I had time to get offended. I crept up the steps with the others and, you were brilliant, he paused and fixed my gaze. Well I uh, I sheepishly stammered, not knowing how to respond. It wasn't too long ago he was calling me a fag and now all of a sudden. I still think you're a fag, he spat. I burst out laughing. Teresa did too. Only joking, he grinned. You might be playing a girl but, he paused and gestured to his own attire, a Bob the Builder inspired outfit that doesn't quite work. I think I'm one of the village people, he grimaced. All we need is a cop and a biker, a soldier and an Apache. Kelly chortled. Meanwhile, my mother was raiding the buffet. She called me over and pushed a plate of food into my hands. Two sausage rolls, a trio of volivants, salmon, mushroom and prawn, a handful of crisps, a slither of pizza, a quarter of a dinky pork pie and several sausages on sticks with either cheese or pineapple. Be careful not to get crumbs on your tutu pita, she says as I bit into a mini sausage roll. It's just a costume. I said as swept a bit of puff pastry off it. It'll probably never be used again. Maybe not but I don't want it getting messy, she said. I shrugged and said it doesn't matter, before biting into the sausage roll once more. Another crumb fell and I brushed it off my tutu. Actually Peter, it does matter. Mum said. I asked Miss York what would happen to the costumes and she said they'd eventually be sold off, so I offered to buy it. Why would you want to buy this? I asked with my mouth still half full of food. As a memento, she replied. You'll have photographs. I know but they're not like the real thing are they? I didn't want to make a fuss there and then. There's enough attention on me as it is. The last thing I want is for everyone to know that my costume will soon be my costume. After the buffet we mingle some more and thankfully most people begin to wander off. I sheepishly saunter up to Miss York and ask her if it's true that she's selling off the costumes. Yes, she said, explaining that every few years they sell off the costumes and props to make room for the new props and costumes that get made for each school play. With two major productions a year, July and December, and limited space, they need to have a cull to make room, she explains. Your mother's already bought that, she tells me. I was just about to ask. I grimly replied. I was hoping she was joking. Don't worry, she grinned. I'm sure it's just a memento. Can't you sell it to someone else? I causally suggested. Well I could, she cautiously replied. But I've got your mother's check in my pocket, and very generous it is too, she said, revealing a check for £100. Hopefully if the DVD works out, we might break even this year. What? I thought. You're not planning on selling it are you? I asked. Hopefully, she said as my eyes opened to the size of saucers. Miss York explained that we weren't informed about all the covert cameras because the prospect of performing in front of an audience was daunting enough, knowing that we were being filmed from all angles would have only added to our nerves. You can say that again. I thought. I returned to my mother who stood with Miss Corelli. They're chatting with both my history and geography teachers. Mr. Mika looked down on me and said it's hard to believe you're one of boys. I shrugged. Mr. Bryant, the history teacher, complimented my routine. Stunning considering, he said. Thanks. I coyly replied. Since it's gone nine o'clock and there's only fifteen or twenty of us left lingering in the gymnasium, I ask my mum if we can we go soon. It's not very professional to leave before your audience. Mrs. Corelli, my former ballet teacher said. Most of the others have gone. 
I stated. Yes, but they're not trained dancers like you are, she smiled. Won't you consider coming back, she asked. Nah. I replied. I used to like dancing but it's not for me. I claimed. This was just a one-off. Well if you change your mind, she said. Oh what's this, she said, peering over my shoulder. I turned to see Miss York the drama teacher approach. In her hands is the big bouquet I'd been given at my curtain call. You forgot this, she said, handing it to me. It's just a prop isn't it? I said as I took it. No, the one Kelly gave you was a prop, this one you've earned, she told me. Oh uh, thanks. I shyly replied. If there's one thing worse than wearing a pink tutu, it's wearing a pink tutu and holding a huge bouquet of flowers. Mum, will you hold these whilst I go and change? I asked her, handing the bouquet to her before turning to Miss York and asking if could go and get changed. My mother replied before Miss York did. I've got your things here, she said. In her hand is my school bag and a plastic carrier bag containing my uniform and footwear. I asked for the carrier bag so I could go and change. There's no need, you can change at home, she said, glancing around the hall. In fact I think they're eager to lock up, she suggested, nodding towards the impatient-looking caretaker who's pacing around and jangling his big bunch of keys. Uh. Okay. I said. Can you hold these whilst I, I handed my mother the bouquet and trotted over to Teresa and Rose. We're gonna go now so. I guess I'll see you both on Monday. I sheepishly said. Yes see why Peter. Rose said. You were great. Thanks. I smiled. So were you. Teresa gave me a big hug and pecked me on the cheek. We'll be the same height on Monday, she smiled as she towered above me. Not if I wear these. I grinned, putting myself on point one final time. I felt like such a ninny as I exited the school wearing my baby pink leotard and tutu. The sun is soon to set on this warm July evening and the numerous plastic gemstones on my tutu and leotard glisten in its final rays. They shine through the delicate layers of my tutu, enhancing its pinkness. Mum insists on taking a photograph. Oh Mu I'm not another one. I whine as she gets her camera out. She must have taken about 15 at the buffet and God knows how many throughout the performance. Oh just a couple. Mum cooed. Your tutu looks lovely in the sunlight. I grumbled and posed for a couple of photos before asking where the car is. I can't spot it in the mostly empty school car park. We came in Mrs. Corelli's car. Mum said. This came as a relief as I momentarily envisaged having to walk home. Mrs. Corelli put me on the back seat, in the middle with my tutu up my back. My pancake skirt is too wide for a seatbelt so I break the law for five minutes until we pull up outside my house. Mum invites Mrs. Corelli in for a coffee and she accepts. The west-west facing front door is illuminated by a dramatic shaft of sunlight and there's a garden path between me and it. I must be a sight to see for any of my neighbours as I scuttle from the car to the door in my sunlit baby pink tights, leotard and tutu. I immediately ask if I can get changed. Oh not yet love, my mother cooed. You've only just got home and you do look ever so sweet. I know but it's embarrassing. I whine. Mum pesters me to keep it on until bedtime and since it's Saturday, bedtime could be as late as 11 o'clock p.m. or midnight if there's a film on. Normally it's about 10 o'clock p.m. so enduring my tutu for another half an hour isn't the end of the world. Can I least take these eyelashes off? I ask. Mum nods and one by one, I carefully peel then off and finally, after a good five hours, my eyelids feel weightless once more. Mum and Miss Corelli settle in the sitting room. Thanks to my attire, the most convenient thing for me to do is kneel on the floor where the disc of my tutu is uninhibited. All they can talk about is the play and the various dream sequences. Thankfully it wasn't all about me. Teresa's teacher dream was the most amusing. She poked fun at teachers, pupils, and politicians. 
Mark's racing driver was the most exciting with the back projection of a race track depicting fast corners, skids and near misses. Mine was beautiful, especially when Kelly handed her dream self the bouquet. Mary's surgeon was also full of humor as well as political comments and Brian's blundering civil engineer had the audience laughing too. Robert's builder was a slapstick routine with plenty of mishaps, but Sarah's astronaut scene rightly stole the show. It was always the most visually spectacular which is why it was saved until the end. The spacesuit costume, the massive ISS model and ISS stage set, the back projection and soundtrack and the I can do anything message, it really did blow my whimsical dance routine out of the water. After a small glass of wine my old ballet teacher left, telling me once again that I was perfect and should seriously consider returning to her ballet class. No I don't think so. I coyly replied. But thanks. I say. She leaves and mum tops up her glass of wine, before flicking through the photos she'd taken on her digital camera. You didn't take loads did you? I asked as she began showing me them. No just a few, she said. There were three of me on stage, a further five afterwards with various cast members and one of me and mum, then two outside in the sunlight. You look like you belong in a music box in this one, she said. I'm holding the third position and she's absolutely right. I can't wait to see the DVD. I didn't even know they were making one until afterwards. I stated. I'm gonna be called Billy for the rest of my life now. I whined. Oh it'll soon wear off. Mum said in an empathetic tone. Don't you think it would have been boring playing a Billy Elliot character instead of a ballerina, she asked. No it wouldn't. Of course it would, she said, casting her eyes over my costume. You'd have been wearing shorts and a t-shirt instead of your beautiful tutu. Would you have even worn stage makeup? And dancing a boy's routine wouldn't have been half as challenging, she said. You were clearly elated when you'd finished, she said. You were positively glowing with pride when you took your bouquet. I was crapping myself. I claimed. Quite possibly, but you can't deny that you looked beautiful and danced wonderfully.